I now declare that the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened and open session, that all council members are present. Our first item on the preliminary agenda is consideration and action resulting from the executive session. Primarily, we have a personnel reappointment uh, regarding the North Texas Municipal Water District Board. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Smith and I are, are very happy that uh, Mr. Dyer is willing to serve, um, continue in his service, so we would like to uh, move that we uh, reappoint him for another two years. <clears throat> Thank you. No second. Second. Thank you. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes. Thank you. Our next item is the uh, is departmental report for the police. Police Chief Ed Drain. Good morning, uh, or good afternoon, or excuse me, good evening, Mayor and uh, Council. I'd like to give you a uh, quick update on the uh, police department. Uh, this is our operating budget, about $88 uh, million. Uh, we are authorized 417 sworn positions within the police department. Uh, as you know, the council previously granted us authorization to go 11 officers over that. So, so for a total, we can, go, we can hire up to 428 officers. These are the number of uh, civilian employees we have and the number of volunteers that we have in our CAP uh, program and our Police Academy Alumni Association program. Uh, we are also a CALEA accredited agency. Uh, CALEA is the most stringent accreditation body for law enforcement. There are about 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the U United States. Fewer than 1,000 have met this level of accreditation. Uh, we will be up for reaccreditation here this June, and uh, I'm very confident that we'll do fine uh, when they calm down for that. This is our organizational chart at the police department. And so we have uh, two assistant chiefs, and then we have two what are called administrative managers that are civilian employees that are like assistant chiefs. Because we are a 143 civil service city in Plano, uh, our civilian personnel cannot supervise sworn. So our civilian managers have all of the uh, areas in the police department that don't have any sworn staff. Uh, for staffing, we use a formula called the Standard Service uh, Index, SSI, um, and, and, and basically what we want to do with this formula is uh, we want our officers to be on calls for service 40% of the time, and, then, and that's called committed time, and we want their uncommitted time to be 60%. Uh, that means that they're not do that's not time that they're not doing anything. That's the time where they do traffic enforcement, uh, community policing, community engagement, proactive enforcement uh, during that 60% of, of, of uncommitted time. Uh, so we're doing fine on that. So from this standpoint, we will not be asking or requesting any additional officers for first responders based on SSI. Now keep in mind, SSI is only for first responders. It is not for neighborhood police officers. It's not for detectives, for training positions, and things of that nature, just beat officers. Uh, we don't use a standard of so many officers per 1,000 residents, uh, but so this is up here just for comparison's sake on how we are doing compared to some of our suburban neighbors and some of our larger cities. And as you can imagine, some of the bigger cities do require more officers per 1,000 residents than some of the suburban cities. But we're right in the middle uh, of, of uh, this comparison. So uh, to, to talk more specifically about staffing, as I said, we're authorized 417 police officer positions. Uh, as of today, we're staffed at 414. Uh, this morning, we hired four uh, officers who are already Texas certified officers. So we, don't, we didn't have to hire them uh, in conjunction with an academy class. Uh, those officers are from here in North Texas and will do fine. And so they'll have a, a, a shorter uh, training cycle. Instead of about 50 weeks of training, theirs will be more about 20 weeks of training. Uh, so we have uh, four applicants out with job offers. Uh, and our next academy will start on May 22nd. So we have about 10 people that are still remaining on the list. So I would anticipate that um, we will have anywhere from uh, six to 10 officers potentially starting the academy. 
uh, on uh, May 22nd. So the bottom line is, you know, right now today we're less than 1% down. We may be over that 417 mark when we start our next academy. So from a hiring and staffing standpoint, we're doing fine. We're doing excellent, quite frankly, uh, compared to most other agencies our size and larger across the state and across the nation. This is our mission statement. And then to, to determine uh, how we are doing with our mission statement, we look at four performance measures. These don't change. Uh, you know, I helped Chief Rushing come up with these when I was here before, and so I haven't changed them uh, now that uh, now that I've become chief. That's our crime rate, our traffic safety, timely service, and quality of service. For crime rate, what we look at are uh, eight offenses. They are called uh, uh, Uniform Crime Report UCR offenses. There are four violent crimes and four property crimes, and um, and we track those on our crime rate. For traffic safety, what we look at is all accidents that are reported to us. We look at injury accidents, and of course, we look at fatalities. For timely service, we this, it's broader than our response times, but that is the quantitative thing that we can look at because we do have a I can get that off of our computer-aided dispatch system. Uh, and so uh, we primarily track timely service by our response time. And quality of service, we use surveys that I will talk about. So for, so these are the, um, uh, the offenses that we look at for violent crime. So typically, uh, 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 or the offenses that we look at for our crime rate. And so typically, when you're looking at you know, reading a publication on one of the online forums that talk about that's comparing city A to city B in crime or the safest cities, they are typically typically going to be using these eight offenses, or if they're talking about just violent crime, they're gonna be using just those four violent offenses. So uh, in 2022, for last year, our crime rate actually did go up a bit. And uh, even though our violent crime went down, which across the nation, most violent crime was going up, but, uh, but, but uh, we see that ours went down. And property crime, though, went up quite a bit. And what's going on with property crime, and, and because, again, we're seeing that not just across North Texas, the state, but across the nation, it's catalytic converters. Uh, people are stealing those left and right. Not an easy answer for, for us to tell folks on that. On, for a regular a burglary of a motor vehicle, you know, we can encourage people to lock their cars, hide their property, take it with them, and we can see those go down. You can't take your catalytic converter into the restaurant with you when you go to eat. And, uh, and, and what's driving the catalytic converter thefts is the metals that are in those thefts. So there are three metals. There's uh, uh, platinum, palladium, and, ro and uh, rhodium that's in there. And uh, uh, platinum, quite frankly, is the least expensive of those three. It's about $1,000 an ounce. Uh, palladium is, and, and these, they have spot prices that change every day, of course, but it's about $1,300 an ounce, and rhodium is over $10,000 just for one ounce of it. And so that's what's driving the theft of the catalytic converters out there. And again, like I said, we're seeing this all across the country. So crime rate, here's a 10-year a kind of a trend line. Of, of where we stand. We're at about 20.29 20, uh, uh, offenses per 1,000. The last couple of years, we had actually been below 20 offenses per 1,000. Crime rate did go up last year, but for a city of almost 300,000 to have offenses around 20 offenses per 1,000 is exceptionally a uh, good crime rate for our city. Be, it would be very difficult to find another city our size across the nation that has a similar crime, uh, crime rate as ours. And this is uh, just violent crime, 1.58 uh, per 1,000 residents. And so, you know, it's been higher, it's been lower, uh, but, uh, but it is a decrease from last year. Property crime, same, it's been up, it's been down, uh, but, it, but it is up quite a bit from last year. And again, that's uh, more related to the catalytic converted thefts. So here's uh, traffic safety numbers. Uh, we also saw some increases in our um, uh, number of traffic crashes that we had. Our fatalities were up quite a bit last year. Injury crashes were up. Uh, just, uh, you know, since we have come out of the pandemic, people are just driving faster. There's a lot more traffic out. Uh, during the pandemic, 2020 in particular, we had some of the lowest traffic volume out there. Traffic crashes overall were down, but we had some of the highest fatality rates. I think we were up to about 17 fatalities that year. Very, very high. One of the highest in the last 10 years. Um, uh, and, and people still just they haven't slowed down since then. So that's what's driving that. And again, 10-year comparison, 
uh, for traffic safety. Uh, and again, there, are, there have been some years where it's been even higher than it is now, as you can see. Uh, here is a traffic uh, hotspot. So uh, that hot area, as you can probably discern, is US 75. Uh, what's unique about this is uh, US 75 is consistently the place where we have the most traffic crashes, even though we have more traffic volume over in on the west side of town. Uh, uh, and you know, as you know, some of us have talked about before, some of some of that the, that the, those traffic crashes along US uh, 75 and Central Expressway is related to how the roadways in some areas you're getting up on the ramps as other people are coming off, and that contributes to some of those accidents. Timely service. Uh, so our response time goals are uh, five minutes, uh, less five minutes or less for priority one calls, emergency calls, eight minutes or less for all other calls for service, and um, this is our, our priority one response time. And we have consistently beat it. In fact, over the last ten years, we've never not um, met our response time goals. In the aggregate, we haven't. We had had some problems in the past out in West Plano. I think we corrected that, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on when we look at a sector by sector breakdown. But uh, but that seems to have uh, alleviated itself with some changes we made to our beach structure last year. And then this is uh, for all other priorities. Uh, eight, again, eight minutes or less is our goal. And as you can see, for 2022 and for the last 10 years, we have uh, met that goal. Those are some pretty aggressive response times when you consider the traffic uh, volume that we have in our city and the number of people passing through. But again, like I said, you guys are, are doing a really good job of getting to those calls quickly. Quality of service. Um, we recently changed how we were doing our surveys. We were sitting it out snail mail. We're now using SurveyMonkey like the rest of the world. Uh, we saw our uh, returns go up about four, about four times what we normally get. And, uh, and for the first time, our ratings were not at 90%, about 86% uh, based on that. Um, uh, and, uh, but you would expect it to go down some when you broaden the number of responses that you get back. Not, not really a big deal, but... Um, but, but for the most part, though, we continue to get A's and B's on the surveys that we sent out, which you would expect because we're doing them. But ETC is the city's, uh, does the surveys for the city. And, and uh, we consistently see that uh, uh, when the businesses, they switch every year. So one year they'll do re residents, the next year they'll do businesses. When they do residents, the fire department always comes out on top at about 96%, and we're in second place at around 90, 92%. However, when they do the business, when they do the residents, when they do the businesses, we typically come out on top about 95%, uh, and then the fire is in the, in the lower in the 90s. Uh, but I tell you, what makes me proud as a resident and as, and as an employee of the city is the fact that when you compare our city to the other customers of ETC, you know, uh, when they do their big fancy brochure, Plano clearly comes out heads and tails above all of their other customers across the board, and I think that's really impressive as a city. So just a quick, some, some summaries, crime rate, uh, again, uh, we did have some increases in property crime, traffic safety, crashes and injuries were up, timely service, no issues there at all, quality of service, we're still doing good in that area. I want to talk about school safety because that was such a big deal with Uvalde, the, the Uvalde situation uh, uh, last year. Uh, so for our school program, we have two sergeants. We have a total of 26 school resource officers. Uh, for PISD, we have a school resource officer in the elementary school, uh, elementary schools, and the um, uh, pardon me, in the middle school and high school, and then we have two in each of the senior high schools. Uh, we have uh, five Frisco schools in our city, so we have an officer at the middle school. Uh, they have four elementary schools in our city. So after Uvalde, um, Frisco asked for an officer, one officer, to, to patrol the four elementary schools uh, in our city. They asked relatively late. The city manager had already briefed the council uh, on the budget, and uh, so I explained that to them, and they said they would cover the cost. Uh, they said, could we add an officer if they would agree to cover the, all of the costs for this current school year, which... Uh, I told them, yeah, I think I will go talk to the city manager about that. And, uh, and then you all agreed to do that. So, uh, but uh, uh, next year, though, we'll have to pick up that cost 50-50 split, the same split that we have with PISD. 
So, uh, so, 20, so 24 school resource officers for PISD and then two for um, Frisco. Now, uh, after Uvalde, there was a call to put an officer in every school, including the elementary schools, early learning centers, and um, city manager and I, and uh, deputy city manager, Rife and I met with the superintendent and we agreed that we didn't think that we needed to do that. That would have been a, probably an additional 38 officers if we had one in each school. Uh, but what we did agree to do though was uh, all of our schools are in a beat and uh, some are in a neighborhood where our neighborhood police officers work. So what we have tasked those officers to do is make two checks at their schools that are in their area twice a day during school days. So they do one exterior check, they do, and then one check where they go inside, talk to the staff, just make sure everything okay, show the flag. And, and we have found some unlocked doors on the exterior checks. And so uh, that seems to be working and we will continue to do that. The officers are required to mark out as if it's a call for service so that we've got some accountability to make sure it's happening. And we think that that's, uh, uh, is going to work and then there's no need for the officers at the elementary school. Now, some of the things that have been going on around the country have been happening at elementary schools, but here in Plano though, our elementary schools are locked down very, 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 very tight uh, compared to you know, the senior highs, for example, it's like a college campus. There's just no way that you could, you know, you could do that. So, uh, so we think that that's, uh, you know, a good compromise on how we're doing it with PISD. And of course, with Frisco ISD, they've got the one officer that's patrolling the four schools. And this is the training that our school resource officers get. Uh, we have something called NASRO, National Association of School Resource Officers. So there's a, a basic course they go to for 40 hours. Later on, they go to the um, advanced course, another 40 hours. T. Cole, our commissioning body here in Texas, also has a, a, a specific course for school resource officers. This uh, threat behavioral assessment training, those are for kids who are present some kind of a threat. They, they're put out of school and then there is a kind of a, a, a meeting uh, where they discuss that and you have to be trained in that. So all of our school resource officers are trained in that along with some of the staff uh, from in the various school district. Uh, all of our officers get active shooter training at least once a year, but our school resource officer gets it two times a year. They all are trained in uh, crisis intervention team training, which is 40 hours of mental health training. And to work as a SRO in our schools, you have to be uh, qualified on a patrol rifle. And they all have patrol rifles at the schools. Access also came up as, an, uh, in, uh, as a uh, factor in Uvalde getting into, although now we know the door was actually unlocked. But um, uh, so what we have for PISD is everyone, chief one down, has a proximity car that we can use to at least get into the uh, initial doors at the school. Uh, and then if someone leaves, retires, resigns, uh, doesn't come back, we notify PISD and then they just uh, scratch their name off the list and deactivate that car. Frisco ISD uses a different system. They use master keys. So uh, each, uh, each of our two Frisco officers have a master key. Our two SRO sergeants have a master key. And then in our substations on Independence and at um, uh, Robinson and McDermott, in our key vending machine where we keep our keys for the vehicles, uh, we have a master key for the Frisco schools in there as well. And of course, with that vending machine, we can track if someone gets the key out or moves it or whatever. Uh, we'll be able to figure, who out, figure out who did that. And then if uh, those master keys don't work, we have these master keys to get in. So this Jersey claw breaching tool looks very simple, but it is very, very effective tool. Uh, before, uh, previous to Uvalde, we had kits in just the sergeant's cars. There are about three or four different items in there, hard to keep track of, very difficult to use. This tool is so simple, it's, it's amazing. So, so this is in every patrol vehicle. Uh, this, this Jersey claw breaching tool. And then in our uh, armored vehicle, we have a kinetic breaching tool. It's powered by a 44 long co uh, coat blank and pretty sure it'll open any door in the city. Also wanna talk about our neighborhood police officer program. So in that program, we have three sergeants and 27 officers. We have 10 officers out it to cover both the shops of Legacy and Legacy West. We have eight officers that are in residential neighborhoods, primarily here in East Plano. We have about two or three that are on just on the uh, west side of US 75 in some neighborhoods over there. We have two officers for downtown. We have one officer for the Day Labor Center in Dart. 
We have, uh, in our mental health and homeless program, we have uh, four officers and we have a civilian licensed clinical social worker who uh, also is uh, assigned to that unit. And then we have two, what we call POP officers. They handle long-term special projects like uh, the short-term rental issues, uh, problem bars, neighborhood uh, neighbor disputes, and things of that nature. Uh, relatively small unit, but they punch uh, well above their weight. And then this is a map of where our neighborhood officers uh, are, are assigned in their areas of responsibility. So I want to talk about, uh, just real quickly, a reorganization that we're going to do uh, 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 here in the police department here in the near future. So we primarily have 12-hour shifts, so most of the guys come in over four time periods. At, For example, if they come in at 6.30 in the morning, they're going to leave at, at 6.30 p.m. in the evening and uh, across the four sectors. But, the, but at uh, 4 o'clock, though, we have something called Second Watch. The purpose of Second Watch is to provide uh, relief so that when these the regular guys are in briefing, then they go down, they go cover their sectors, cover their area, handle their calls for service when those guys leave. Uh, as you can see, they work from, uh, from 4 o'clock to 2 in the morning. That's 10 hours, which means they have staggered days off. So we have two squads. One squad briefs out of the main police department here uh, near downtown, and the other one briefs up out far west Plano. And um, because they don't have beat responsibility, they are going to be the, the last units, the, the, the lowest priority for fill as we're filling positions. And Chief Russian put this unit as an option initially when we went to 12-hour shifts. That was very controversial in the police department. That was a big deal. <clears throat> it isn't anymore. That was over 10 years ago. Guys like it. They're doing it. Uh, but he wanted to provide an option for guys who just didn't think that they could work 12-hour shifts. And that's why. So that's 20 positions. 10 officers positions in each uh, each side of town. Uh, so we're going to we're going to disband that shift. Uh, when the officers uh, do their regular bid coming up this summer. And so I mentioned I mentioned earlier that we had we had some response time issues out in West Plano. So we've got two radio channels that we we use command area one command area two. The dividing line is Custer Road that div divides the two command areas. As you can see ge from a geographical standpoint, Command Area 2 is a much larger area. There is also a lot more traffic volume uh, out in uh, Command Area 2, which is why we were having some problems with the response times. So what we did was is D sector to the far west was a uh, uh, the boundary, their east boundary previously went over to Court Road. We moved that boundary over to Ohio last January and we expanded the size of C sector. C sector was primarily a lot of residential before that. Now, of course, they've picked up some of the uh, some of the business along Court Road, and then we reduced the size of D sector. And we couldn't continue to add more officers to D sector because it would be beyond the span of control for a sergeant. We had already done that just before I left uh, previously, and so we couldn't. We really couldn't add any more officers. We really needed to sh shrink the size of D sector. So we did that. Now, um, how we determine our minimum staffing is based off the number of beats we have. Right now, we have 25 beats, right? So, um, and, and since we added the two beats to C sector, we now have 14 officers minimum working channel one and 11 officers minimum working, I'm sorry, working on channel two and 11 officers minimum working on channel one. However, when we look at the calls for service, they're almost exactly 50-50. Uh, channel 2 has about 50.5, Channel 1 about 49.5, pretty close to that. And so, and we've also got some redevelopment projects coming along here on Channel 1 that you guys are aware, aware of, of course. Um, the old Collin Creek Mall, uh, Spring Creek Avenue K, uh, I think eventually the um, Levon Farms area is going to be redeveloped. And uh, so we need more uh, um, permanent officers on Channel 2. Right. I'm sorry, on channel one. So we're going to create an, an additional beat in B sector and an additional beat in A sector. That is going to take 12 police officers to do that, to have an officer there 24 seven. So of the 20 officers we're disbanding, 12 of them are going to go to new beats on channel one, command area one. And, and, and as a result, instead of our minimum staffing for beat officers being 25 around the clock, it'll be 27 around the clock. 
Uh, and, and so now that leaves eight officers left over because I promised the guys all 20 of those positions are gonna go back into patrol. So the other eight positions, we have eight squads that work um, the late shift. Each one of them will get an additional officer, which we've never done before. Typically, those two mirror each other. However, during the day shift though, we have, those guys have help potentially because we have NPOs out there, we have traffic officers out there, we have high vis officers out there, we have a lot of people that can help the guys on day shift. At a certain point in the evening, all those are gone. Whatever minimum staffing is, that's what we have. And occasionally we may get a SWAT call out or we may get a five car crash up on US 75. So, so we're gonna use those eight officers to, to buff up the guys that work uh, overnight. But now I have two, two sergeants though that I can use too. So um, I didn't promise them that the two sergeants would stay in patrol because I'm gonna need one of them over on the investigative side of the house. So right now I have what's called a crimes against persons unit. Those are the guys that handle the major cases, the sexual assaults, the um, aggravated assaults, the homicides, the big stuff. That sergeant has uh, 14 detectives in one civilian position. Three of his detectives though focus on sex crimes where the people are not in the same family. I also have a family violence unit, and that sergeant has nine detectives and a civilian, and she also has three detectives who focuses on sex crimes within the family. So that model that we're using is not the best model in my view. So we're gonna create what's called a special victims unit by taking the three sergeants, uh, three, three detectives from crimes against persons and three uh, from the family violence unit, uh, some of you may know Detective Jeff Rich. He's actually assigned to the FBI, but he works out of our building. He does the internet uh, crimes against children, and we're gonna put Jeff in that unit as well. And, uh, and, and so I'm gonna use one of the sergeants that I'm taking from Second Watch for, to fill that position. It may not be that particular sergeant, but that position will be, be used for that. And we don't have any space over at, uh, uh, in our main building for that, but we've already talked to the Children's Advocacy Center, they've got space, and so we'll lease space from them and just put those guys uh, out there. And that'll take up one of the sergeant's position. Uh, and I also really need to do this as well because, as I said, my crimes against persons unit are handling the most complex cases in the police department, but yet their sergeant has the greatest number of employees as a first line supervisor within the police department. By far, that's way too many detectives to have to try to manage. So, so I really need to get the number of employees reporting to that first line supervisor down, and that's one way we were able to do that. So here are some of our community partnerships. Uh, uh, most of some of these you've probably seen before. The one that may be new is the bottom one, Mental Health Resource Awareness Program. So what we do here is uh, we did two of these sessions last year. They were a phenomenal hit. Just in talking to different people about mental health, they had a lot, just people in the community, people in churches and businesses have contacted us with employees, family members. What do I do? You know, I've got a, you know, um, one in five people in, in the United States have some sort of a mental illness. And so it affects a lot of families. So what we do is we take about six, seven hours. And then uh, we have, of course, our employees talk to them. We bring in the mental health judge. We bring in our, be, uh, our uh, life path system, our behavioral health authority here in Collin County. Uh, we bring in, there's an attorney and, uh, who works for Collin County. She's not with the DA's office. Her job is to try to get people out on their own recognizances if they've got minor offenses, if they've got mental illnesses in jail. So we bring her in to talk about her program and folks just absolutely love it because now they, they, they kind of, they, they know where to go when they've got different issues going on. So, so that's the newest community partnership we've added. Some additional issues that we have to deal with, urban growth, of course, homelessness, uh, mental uh, health consumers. Fentanyl is, is probably a new one on here. Uh, in 2021, we had 12 people who overdosed on, fent on um, some type of illegal drug and died. Uh, in 2022, that number was up to 25, more than double uh, over the course of a year. So there is no question that this is a, uh, a crisis and um, we are working on this. All of our officers have uh, Norcan uh, on them. Uh, we are part of a national overdose mapping program where we put our overdoses in and then we can, we can kind of see w when different things are, 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 are happening, when drugs are changing. Um, we have officers assigned to the FBI, specifically to a drug squad, to, uh, to the DEA, specifically to handle uh, opioids. 
Uh, so we're working with the feds on that as well. But uh, fentanyl is, uh, is certainly an issue uh, that's affecting our community. And that is all that I have. What questions can I answer for you? Oh, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I know we saw an increase in um, the youth violence rate. Are we still seeing that? Has that improved? Or um, what are I'm you sorry, seeing? I'm what, sorry, what violence? Youth and in crimes by youth in our community. Are you still seeing that? Has that subsided some since the pandemic? Or are we still seeing a lot of crimes by youth in our community? Uh, you know, I'd have to go back and check. I don't recall us having a big uptick in, in youth violence, even during the pandemic, uh, not, not, not here. When schools opened back up, there were some, not just here, but really certainly across Collin County, we were seeing some things going on in the schools, but um, not, not, I, I'm not aware of there being a particular surge in youth violence or youth crimes, but we can go, I can certainly go back and go pull that down and see, get that to you. Yes, ma'am. So um, I have a question. I, I understand, actually, <clears throat> Chief Drain, you're one of the uh, main person when it comes to mental health um, awareness. And, and I, I believe that you were the proponent of a lot of the mental health awareness in many of the police departments. My, my question is, um, there are a lot more mental health issues amongst people who commit crime. And that's sort of become linked to drugs because they self-medicate and that links to other crimes that, you know, like the theft and the robbery and so on and so forth because of the drugs that they're taking. Is there some way that um, we could somehow, instead of just putting them in jail or arresting them, in, in, uh, is there some place or some resource that we could try to assist in in us, you know, in in helping it so that we don't cram our jails with people with population with mental illness. I mean, I know the state. I mean, I know a lot of the state jails are now, you know, with the backlog over a year with men, you know, for mentally ill patients. So, what 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 are some of the? I mean, have you explored like what are some of the issues that or some of the um, options that we may have? Yes, you know, one of the options that we've talked about here in Collin County with the sheriff, with the county, uh, I think Dallas County just opened up, and I, I can't remember the name of the facility, uh, and it's slow going, uh, the officers have to get used to it, but a, a lot of the mental uh, patients go to jail because of criminal trespass. Uh, now, that's, sometimes that's an issue for the people, for the jail custodians, because, that, you know, th this percentage of your folks up here are up here for criminal trespass, and However, you know, we have to also look at that from the standpoint of the victim. So, you know, if you own a business and you've got this guy and he's urinating in the corner, you know, and, and he won't leave, you're, we just can't leave him there because he's got a mental illness and, 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 and he may not fit the criteria to go to the hospital. So what Dallas County has did is that they've opened up a facility for offenses like that where they can go put them in where they're not particularly violent. And, and, and not go to jail. Now, the sheriff uh, in Collin County, I believe, are working on trying to come up with some place like that here in Collin County that we can use. And so that is a model they're using down in the Houston area. So yeah, so there are some things out there, but uh, it's gonna be beyond my, my pay grade to be able to make those things happen here in our county. <clears throat> Shelby. Uh, thank you very much, Chief, for the comprehensive report. So um, uh, my questions revolve around SSI. Um, so with the current SSI model, is that going to change our staffing needs once we uh, implement the two new beats? Once we implement the what? The two new beats going from 25 to 27? No, no. So the, the data that we get, because again, all 20 of those patrol officers are going somewhere back in patrol, number one. And number two, uh, and now that 60-40 model that we talk about, it may not apply to this particular officer. What we look at is in the aggregate. We, got, we have a CAD, a computer aided dispatch, so we can get precisely how much time we spend on each calls for service. And I don't anticipate that changing because we no longer have second watch. Okay, and uh, if I understood correctly, you said that uh, you only use SSI for beat officers. That's correct. Um, how do we determine our staffing needs for neighborhood officers and detectives and, and other and civilian? 
for detectives, and we have to do it on the year that we go for re reaccreditation. So we do what's called a, a uh, workforce analysis that my planning and research coordinator is working on as we speak, because as I said, uh, our due date for this is uh, June for our reaccreditation. And so we look at that every five, every four years. Uh, and for neighborhood, for neighborhood officers, there is no, it's gut. You know, Perfect. I mean, you know, I, you know, we, we have a lot of problems with mental health. We need to add somebody. We can <clears> kind of predict before Legacy West opens, before shops of Legacy open. We know that we're going to have crowds. We know that people are going to be walking around and some of them are going to have, have consumed alcohol. You got to have cops on the ground walking around. You can't have them driving through. So some of that is just based off of our experience, but there's no quantitative way to nail some of those kind of things down. Quite, and, and with detectives, primarily what we do is when we see certain types of offenses increasing, like um, financial crimes obviously is, is the one that it's really hard to put your finger on. You know, a violent crime is, uh, uh, we got great detectives like John Hay over here doing a good job. They've got a handle on that. And, but, uh, but some of our, um, uh, financial related crimes, computer related crimes, those are, of course are going to go up. And so we have to be able to adjust for that. Okay. So with the detective, if I'm understanding correctly, you uh, assess the need for detective staffing based on, in the reaccreditation process, which is this year. So right. as we understanding that it, we're not there yet, but as we head into the budget, do you anticipate that we're going to need to bring on additional detectives? No, 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 we, we, okay. no, we're not. And quite frankly, we've already, even though we haven't submitted our actual budget to HR, we've already given them some idea of what personnel we think we need. And within the police department, I don't think anticipate us needing any additional sworn personnel. I think I'm asking for two civilian personnel. <clears throat> and one of them for this special victims unit, I've got to have an admin to, to handle their workload for sure. So yeah, okay. so that's what, we're, that's what we're looking at. And I assume for civilian staff, it's the same equation as neighborhood officers, just go with your gut? Yeah, that's right. I mean, with, with certain things, if we're seeing increases in our jail population, if, um, mm -hmm. if we change the type of calls for service that our public safety officers, our PSOs can handle drastically to where we know their workload is gonna pick up, then we'll, we'll know that we'll need to add bodies. For example, we've, we have a supervisor and three digital media uh, specialists. So we've gotten some new technology to force our way into these latest phones, great key. Some, some of our detectives are trained on that, but it's taking away a lot of their time <coughs> on doing what detectives do. So we wanna move that over to the forensic unit. So if the forensics unit with three people, now they've gotta pick up all these phones, then I, I've got to ask for an additional body for them. It wouldn't be fair to ask them to take on this mission without additional people. So it's some things like that that are just common sense that we need to add somebody when you give people a bigger mission. Right, okay. And uh, you said we've got four job offers out right now. Is that, uh, is that for the 11 overhires that were authorized or are those two disconnected numbers? Is that like four out of 11 or are those nothing? Uh, yeah, they're not, they're not connected. So we're okay. at 414. And if we, um, uh, we're at 414, actually one of those may have gone away, so we may only have three job offers out. So okay. if we could bring those folks on today, we would be at, at exactly 417, you mm -hmm. see what I mean? But we don't need to bring them on yet because they've got to go through the basic academy and th that's not gonna start until May 22nd. Okay, and the how long is the academy? The started today are already certified. Okay, how long is the academy? I should know this. Uh, well, the, uh, the basic academy itself, for the TCO portion is 28 weeks, and then we have four weeks of unique Plano stuff, so 32 weeks, and then we have 16 weeks of field training. Okay. So about 50 weeks, roughly. Okay, thank you, Chief. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Holmer, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, thank you for the presentation. I attended the open house um, for to educate people on the fentanyl that the police put on recently and really appreciated that. Um, I have two kids in Plano schools and, and one had a classmate that passed away recently and I didn't even know about it until quite a while after. And so um, a few different things. Well, one thing that came out of that session that I thought was really helpful was learning that Narcan won't harm someone if it's administered and, and not needed. So I thought that was really, really helpful. Um, I spoke to a lot of the families um, afterwards, and one actually sent me home with some Narcan, and I thought I felt kind of good that I was prepared. And then I was at last Friday, I attended the police award ceremony, which was wonderful to celebrate all of our uh, first responders and, and the great work that they do. But a lot of the awards were related to life-saving efforts, which again, we were happy to applaud. 
Um, I was surprised to learn that many of those were related to administering Narcan, and it wasn't even one or two doses that was needed. It was three or four doses. Um, so it kind of made me reevaluate how prepared I would be if, if, if I needed to, to help out. I guess the, the point I'm trying to, to get to is um, what, what else can we do? Um, do you see any best practices? Do you see anything in other cities, both for raising awareness, for just equipping, um, and, and I know some of this is, is a shared responsibility with PISD as well um, when it comes to our youth, but I, I know that there's um, frustration, and, and mm -hmm. to me, I, 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 I'm sure maybe we're doing more than I, I realize, but having two kids in the schools, I, it wasn't really on my radar the way it should have been, and um, I'm just wondering if there's anything we can do as a council, as a city, is there, are there additional resources, how can we better educate, be prepared? Is, is there anything else we can do? Because it really is heartbreaking to see these statistics and the, the increase, and hopefully we're, it won't just continue. But if there's anything that we can do, I'd like to know about it. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, offhand, I can't think of anything that the council, you know, can do. I think we as a police department need to continue to have the forums like you attended. We need to continue to put information out on social media. We need to continue to partner with uh, PISD and Frisco ISD and, uh, you know, our partners up in Collin County that, that deal with this, but, you know, just educating the public about this. And, um, you know, the state of Texas, the DEA are using that one pill can kill as they're, you know, I, you know, eventually if we keep saying it, that message can, can sink through. And uh, sometimes these public information campaigns, we saw it that it can work with DWI. We've seen changes in how people approach uh, domestic violence. And, uh, and so I just think we just have to keep pushing the message. There is also some legislation pending down in Austin related specifically to fentanyl. Uh, it would be my hope that it, that would allow us, one of the reasons we partner with the feds uh, the federal law enforcement agencies that if someone overdoses on an illicit drug and if someone gave them those drugs, then uh, that person can be charged with the crime at the federal level for specifically doing that. And uh, we don't have that capability at the state level. At the state level, we can get them for, for trafficking, for manufacturing and delivering is actually what it's called. And then if they're convicted of that, we can get an enhancement to that conviction. But we can actually charge them with that death at the federal level. And then so that's what the pending legislation is mm -hmm. in Austin is looking at. However, they're only looking at that for fentanyl. And I said we had 25 uh, overdose deaths last year. About three quarters of those fentanyl was either the cause or one of the drugs that was in their body. But there are other drugs out there that can kill people as well. And I think we need to have that ability for all of those drugs. <clears throat> yeah. So those those are some of the things that are going on out there. So. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Chief Drain, for that great presentation. Uh, just a quick follow-up on the subject of mental health. I know that uh, many officers are trained with uh, crisis intervention training, CIT. Um, how widespread is that uh, within the department, and are there plans for additional uh, crisis intervention training? Oh, no, yeah, no, we are we're probably not at 100 percent. There may be some outliers, but for the most part, yeah, we almost all of our officers are CIT trained. Oh, that's fantastic. The legislature yeah. may be two sessions ago, mandated CIT training for new officers. They don't have to get it in the academy, but that's where we teach it. But they I have see. to get it before they can get their next level of licensing, which is the intermediate license. So we just decided to put it in the academy and get it knocked out so we don't have to send them back. But in Plano, we had already been doing CIT when I was here for years. Yeah. We, probably 2012, maybe, you know, uh, 2010. We started, and it took us five, and our goal then was all of our uniformed officers, every patrol officer, mm -hmm. every SRO, if you wear a uniform, then you need to get that training. And so uh, so we've been well ahead of the curve on CIT training for years. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, council Thank members. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Chief, uh, first of all, I'm <coughs> really glad to hear that, uh, that we're doing a great job retaining uh, existing uh, PD members, but also that we're, we're a very desirable place to work and we're having uh, you know, good uh, results getting uh, new officers in there. With, with that in mind, one thing I, I want to ask you on, on the elimination of the second watch, do you feel that's a permanent thing or is, is there some plan to reevaluate in a, in a certain period of time? Because I just, as I recall uh, from some of the reports that that was generally, that was a pretty widely liked uh, option for some of the officers uh, to have to, to work the, the second watch. Do you, do you think that 
would be reevaluated at some point in time, or what, what would be the criteria for that? No, and, um, you know, of course, there are going to be some officers that, that, that prefer that shift, but 12-hour um, shifts are so accepted now, it's just, in fact, we have difficulty getting guys to apply for some specialized positions because they like working those 12-hour shifts. What, what they like is having those three days off in a row, mm -hmm. every other weekend having a week, three-day weekend off, take a couple of days off, they can be off for like five or six days. So, um, yeah, so I don't think there's going to be a big push for that. The key is we're getting rid of this shift, and we've talked about it in detail, is <clears throat> we're going to have to have help from some of the specialized units in covering down on the calls to make sure that the day shift guys get off on time. Mm -hmm. After working 12 hours, those guys can't be working for another hour just answering calls. Occasionally, they're going to have to. They're going to make a later rest. And you caught it. I mean, you're going to have to finish it up. And we, you know, we just can't get around that. But we don't want to routinely have the guys working day shift, working late hours. And you know, we've talked about it, uh, and we think we can we can handle that. And quite frankly, the bottom line is is second watch isn't giving us much of a punch. Uh, you know, sometimes there's only a couple of guys in briefing. They don't have any beat responsibility, any minimum staffing. They take off. So there's only a couple of guys in briefing trying to cover a whole you know whole radio channel. They're not really giving us much help at all in that regard. The reason we're getting rid of that unit is I can better utilize those bodies as beat officers with beat responsibility and to try to, to try to even out, balance out the, the bodies on command area one versus command area two. Great, great. And I know you and the department will do everything as possible to keep the morale up and keep people wanting to be at the best PD and probably in the country. So, oh, absolutely. So yeah, thanks yeah, for that. Yeah, well, yeah. one thing just to like end on a, on a happy note, you mentioned the the volunteer, the PCP AAA, and the CAP volu volunteer personnel. Uh, what what was 2022? What was our ending number? How many hours were contributed by by those uh, those folks? Uh, you know, I don't know, sir. Uh, I'll have to go back and get that number. And uh, for 2022, so you want to know the ending? Yeah, I was just, uh, I was just curious. I, I, I missed that number, and I know it used to be it was <laughs> well into the mid teen thousands of hours uh, of annual uh, contribution relating to you know million plus dollars of equivalent staffing time. So I was just curious what our you know last uh, annual number was on that. Okay, yeah, I'll start adding that to the briefing now that you now that you mentioned it. But yeah. our volunteers haven't fallen off. We're still doing. Great job recruiting. Those guys are still at every um, uh, Citizens Police Academy class, you know, <laughs> cooking the food and inviting people to join afterwards. And every class, we get new people that, that join up. And some of them even decide to go even more than that and go into the CAP program. Yep. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Appreciate all your work. Okay. Next item is item three, department report from the Plano Fire Rescue, Fire Chief Chris Biggerstaff. Good evening, Council, Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about the department uh, just a little bit. Um, Start out here with our with our uh, mission statement: professional service with heart, integrity always. It's a little shorter than the police department, so firemen have a harder time remembering those things. So, uh, so we, we keep it shorter. Now, that that really reflects the, the values of our department, and and uh, like the PD had four things that they focus on really. We have, we have three things. A lot of times people will come to me and say, Chief, what is it that's your plan for the, the fire department or what's your vision for the fire department? And we, we take a lot of uh, assistant feedback. We, we have a spot on our website for feedback. We send out uh, 200 cards to EMS uh, patients uh, every month to try to solicit feedback. We do surveys to the citizens for our strategic planning so that we can gain feedback. We take all that feedback and really we developed a very simple plan and that is that uh, when we get a 911 call, we want to get there quick, we want to do good work, we want to show compassion. That's, that's what, uh, what we focus on. And so that plan uh, is, is relatively simple plan, but whenever you figure in that we're an all-hazard department, it gets a little more complex because uh, an all-hazard department is a, de uh, a department that represents every level of hazard response, whether it's a trench rescue, hazard materials, confined space, building collapse, rope 
rescue, fire extinguishment, EMS, swift water, or vehicle extrication. And there's a lot of others I didn't even include in there. So, so you take that simple plan of uh, getting there quick, doing good work, showing compassion, it gets a little more complex whenever you figure out how many different types of calls that you have to be prepared to respond to. So our department's broken down into uh, two divisions and then six sections to help cover these, these uh, types of calls we're referring to. So our first division is our emergency services division. That's Assistant Chief Jaime Reyes, who's over that division. And uh, we have 375 of our 404 uniformed personnel are in this division. And, and the, the first one is the one we're probably almost, the first section in there is the one we're uh, most familiar with, and that's our emergency, emergency operations section. And that's the ones uh, that you see out making the calls. We have 13 engines, five aerial trucks, 10 ambulances, uh, three chiefs and then uh, one squad that are out there. That's a hundred person staffing daily. And th those are the ones you see making the, the emergency calls out there. But if you're gonna be an all hazard department, you have to have the ability to, to make uh, any type of call that comes in. So we have a lot of specialty teams that are, that are prepared to do that. So in our special operations section, that covers our hazmat team, high angle, trench rescue, swift water, structural collapse, wild land, and then also like our tactical medics, different, different specialty teams so that we're able to, uh, we're able to meet the needs on, on all those calls. Our EMS section and our training section, they, they're the ones who are providing the training for our members so that when we get there quick, we go to do good work, we're prepared for that because that doesn't happen by accident. It takes a lot of preparation if you're gonna do good work on all these different types uh, of calls that we have there. So the, the, second, the, the uh, second division that we have, that's our support services division, that's Assistant Chief Moberly that runs that. And if you're gonna make almost 33,000 calls, so you're gonna do that 33,000 times in a year, you're gonna to have to have a lot of support. And so we, we, uh, we have a great support services area and we have our logistics section that makes sure we have good apparatus and good equipment. And uh, they, you, can't, you can't make those calls without, without that kind of support. But another area that we try to do is we try to prevent as many emergencies from happening as we can before they get there. So we have a fire prevention section. They take care of trying to, to prevent uh, fires by doing uh, inspect yearly inspections, doing our plan reviews, uh, code enforcement, all those things to try to prevent that. We also have on the EMS side, we have our community medic program and they, they'll identify high risk groups within the community and try to, to reach out and address those needs before we ever get those 911 calls. And so that's, that's some groups that we have going there. And it, as far as accreditations go, we were fortunate enough the, the, the last council meeting to, to be recognized for our CFAI accreditation. We, we hold a CFAI accreditation, a CAS accreditation, and also an ISO 1. Uh, when we, when, in 2001, when we got that, we were the only, only department in the whole country that has that. We're still the only department in Texas that has all three of those accreditations. And one of the great things about that is it's, it just promotes constant improvement. You're constantly evaluating yourself and, and looking at the benchmarks that you've already set. Just some of the highlights from 2022, we had a very busy year because on, if you went back to those accreditations, um, we had the, the CAS accreditation and the CFAI accreditation. We did all that work there. I think Chief Greif, when he left, he tried to stack them all up right there at the end, so we'd have to do them whenever, whenever I took over. But no, we, we, we had all those that, that kind of came in, and then we're already, this, this part of the year, we're working on our ISO renewal. So we had all those going at one time. But a uh, very busy year in, in 2022. Just some of the highlights where we added uh, a new brush truck, new ladder truck, special operations truck. We hired 30 firefighters, which is a lot for us. We don't normally hire that many. Uh, and then we, the, some of the, the part that made it the busiest was we, we went back to a lot of our public facing things. We went back to our uh, vacation safety school, the Citizens Fire Academy, uh, many of our, our public education events that we had done in the past. One of the best things we did last year was we opened a training center. And I think probably most of you were there for the opening of the training center. And, uh,
my wife, whenever she gets a captive audience, she shows pictures of my grandkids every time. I show pictures of the, the training center every, every opportunity that I get. As you can see, it's already expanded our training. See that picture on the right? That's our city manager up there on that, that aerial ladder uh, doing a little training with us. So last year's call volume, uh, we did, uh, we, on this graph, we show you the last 10 years of the call volume. But you can see we made almost 33,000 calls last year. And it looks like, a, 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 like we went down a little bit from the year before. And we did number-wise. But if you remember in 2021, we made, uh, we made 2,800 calls or 2,900 calls in, in a matter of about five days in 2021. So that kind of skewed the numbers a little bit. We don't normally do that. We normally make about 100 calls a day, and there was a couple of days we made a, almost 1,000 calls. So that, that kind of skewed our numbers just a little bit. So, but if you, if you take that out and you take also we had a winter storm uh, in 2022 at the end that, where we made 700 calls in a real short period of time, you take those two out, and we actually went up about a 6% increase in, in calls for the year. And if you look at the 10 year period, it, it's about a 57% increase over that 10 years there. And it, we've added, uh, Chief Greif when he was here, added uh, an in, engine two, truck or truck eight, and another ambulance. And then last year, uh, y'all were uh, gracious enough to give us two more ambulances to help with the, the uh, call, increasing call volume that we've had. These are our stations in the, the uh, busiest one there, Station 1. That's the district you're sitting in right now. Station 2 over there uh, next to Vines High School. That's our second busiest. And then once you get below that, uh, they usually run about somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 calls a year uh, on a lot of them. We have, do have a couple of slower stations, but the majority of them fit in, in that category. So one of the, the things we talked about when, uh, that's important to us because it, it's, the, it's been the number one uh, thing on all of our surveys, surveys from the citizens, and that's our response time. It's about us getting there quick. And th this is, uh, shows our average response, response times for the year for 2021 and for 2022. That first part, that call, that call processing time, uh, that's our dispatch time, and uh, they do a great job. I don't know if you ever had the opportunity to go sit down in the in dispatch with them, but they it is amazing what they can keep up with at one time and get dispatched uh, at one time. So it, 38 seconds from the time that call comes in till the time the tones go off in the station. And then the, our turnout time, from the time those tones go off to the time our wheels roll out the door, that's a minute and six second average. And then you look at the total average down there, and that's a five minute, 30 second average um, for the total response time. And all those were, were down from the, the previous year, just a little bit. The line below it is just your 90th percentile. 90% of the time, we're getting there in less than eight minutes and one second. These are the type of calls that were going on. Uh, each year. As you can see, the majority of the calls we go on are our EMS calls and uh, the uh, hazardous material calls, are, that's, our, that's our spills, leaks, uh, CO. The good intent calls, those are, those are calls where you're either canceled in route or you get there and it's no emergencies found. Service calls, that, that's your falls, water problems, smoke problem, uh, assist police, those, those type of calls. And then obviously up there, your fire call, uh, that's your 1% there is, is the number of the, the percentage of it that are fire calls. 2022, we had 21,765 EMS calls. And you know earlier we talked about the increase of 57% 57, 57 over the 10 years. Here's one of the causes of that, that increase and that is that uh, you see that, that we transported 7.6 more patients in 2022 than we did in 2021. And the patients that are 65 years or older, they account for 50% of the patient transports there. So as that demographic increases, our patient transports increases, we see, uh, we see our overall call volume uh, increase as well. Last year, uh, we asked for two more ambulances as a result of 
of some uh, data that we had presented city management. Part of that was the med unit overload. And what the med unit overload is, that's whenever uh, we, when we get down to where we only have one ambulance available, then the, the tone is set off uh, throughout the department and lets us know we only have one ambulance available that way. If there's an opportunity to clear up any ambulances, we do that. If, if, that's, if, if that ambulance is called out or we don't get three ambulances available uh, during the next five minutes, we go into what's called med unit overload. And as you can see, the, back in 2018, 2019, we might have done that one, maybe two times a month. And then you move over to 21, 22, we were doing it uh, anywhere from eight to 16 times a month. So it was a significant increase in showing that, that we, we were in need of additional ambulances. And then you can see we put an ambulance in service there in, uh, in, the, in October, October 1st we did. So you can see October 1st of 2022, the numbers started coming down. Then we put an additional ambulance in service there on January 1st, uh, and you can see that the numbers came down a little further. We were hoping they'd come back down to more around that 2018, 2019 number. It looks like we're on pace for about 40 med unit overloads this year based on, on uh, what we've seen so far this year. This is a heat map for our, our uh, EMS calls, and it looks a lot like uh, PD's heat map on when you look at uh, the Air, the area down uh, 75 there. So you, you see a lot of those are gonna be your vehicle accidents and a lot of your other hot spots are gonna be your long-term care facilities uh, that are here in town. Fire incidents, we made 529 fire incidents last year, which is uh, significantly more than the, the years before. And part of that was, if you remember last summer, we had a very dry summer. So we had, uh, we made 103 uh, grass uh, fires versus uh, 41 from the year before. So we're a lot higher in, in that number. That heat map there shows all of the structure fires that we made uh, last year. And then that's our, our customer satisfaction. I, I don't know where Chief Drain came up with that whole part about uh, PD being higher on the other piece. I haven't found that yet, but, but, but I trust him. I trust him that he's probably, probably accurate. So. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Go ahead. Great. Chief, thank you very much. I've got uh, two questions. Um, one, uh, you showed a spike in, in the need for um, boxes out there, ambulances out in the field. It seemed to correspond with the same time that we were dealing with the COVID issue. Is that, it, it was there a relationship between that and the number of calls that we had for, uh, for rescue and EMS units? No, that's a good question. And that, it, that's at first we thought maybe. So, you know, during, during 2020, the first part of COVID, uh, our numbers went way down, actually. And uh, nobody wanted to go to the hospital. Everybody was, was concerned about, about going. We, you know, they weren't sure uh, how that was going to work out. So we didn't, our call volume actually went way down. It, it began to go up um, in, in 2021. And at the beginning of 21, there was a pretty high COVID rate. And so that could have been, we thought, well, that might be part of it, but the numbers never came back down. Even as COVID went down, the numbers didn't come back down. And then again, in 2022, they were, they were, uh, very high during, during that time. So I, I don't, I don't think so. I, because we haven't seen any evidence even this year of them, of them going, uh, back the other direction. So. Okay. Second question, um, and I'm going to I'm going to relate it to you, and I'm also going to relate it to uh, Chief Drain. Um, concern that I have is uh, salaries of our uniformed officers and the um, bonuses and salaries other cities are using now to attract uniform officers into their forces. Um, I would hate to see us lose our well-trained officers to other cities because of bonuses or higher salaries. How are we doing competitive-wise? From a uh, from a salary standpoint, that's a that's a great question. We were actually working with uh, HR last week, just uh, going through looking at the starting salary for uh, departments that we're competing with, and there are a lot of them that are that are doing a lot of the things you said. They're doing bonuses in the front, or they're they've seen a you know a, a pay increase, just doing different things 
doing what they call lateral transfers where you can hire on and you know bring your seniority with you up to a certain point all those things to bump bump those up and so one of the there's one of the things that we're looking at you know asking for in our budget supplements was this opportunity to maybe do something similar to a lateral transfer except we only do two steps and that would be just move move us to the point where we're just topped out from the beginning that would make us more competitive on on that front end uh, of that hiring just on the it would help us with the, that initial salary coming in, which is what a lot of your firefighters are looking at. They're not necessarily looking long term. They're looking at what, what that, that uh, salary is when they start. Chief Train, same kind of question to you. And, and really, um, we're going into a budget um, session, and that's the reason that I'm raising it. Yeah, we certainly have uh, looked at that. But uh, as you saw from our numbers, we're down less than 1%. Uh, from our uh, 417, our total number of, of authorized positions. So at this time, I don't think we need to request that. I did have my budget analyst uh, compute out uh, what it would cost for us to do a lateral hire program at about three years is where, three or four years is where most of our officers, th there are other steps, but that's kind of really where they get the most of their bang for the buck. And so if we brought that in, it was a, and it was a pretty high number, uh, because we would have to go back and all the guys that we've hired uh, who are still below that, who were certified, we would have to pay them that increase as well. So, uh, yeah, so we'll look at that, and I won't be shy about asking for it next, you know, if I think we need to do that later on. Uh, uh, but right now, we're recruiting fine, and I don't think we need to do that. You are right, though. There are quite a few cities surrounding us that are doing that, the Garlands, the Irvings, the Grand Prairies, but we're still, you know, we're, our numbers still look better than theirs, so even though we're not doing that at this time. But that could change, and if that changes, I'll change. Okay. Deputy Mayor. So, Chief, I, this is just out of curiosity. Um, so, I, I've noticed that on those at the the burner kind of map, where you know where all the a lot of the EMS responses mm -hmm. are mostly is on the highway. A am I am I correct about they, that? They they were. Um, they're all focused around the. Yeah. Right. They're, they're, yeah. There's a lot of them right there around Highway 75, just, just like where Chief Drain was talking about the majority of the accidents. Those are going to be a lot of the same calls. The other ones are going to be your long-term care facilities. So uh, my, I personally <clears throat> believe that plain old drivers are very safe drivers. Mm -hmm. So I would be very curious to see the percentage of the, um, the assistance that we actually put out in these roads. I mean, are these all drive-through? I mean, these are bypassing Plano drivers that are going to a different city rather than the, our Plano resident. I, I want to see how much percentage of those responses are actually helping out-of-city out type um, incidents. So. Okay, uh, I'll look. Uh, we'll see what I can come up with on that because I, I, don't, I don't know, we, but we can check and see uh, if we can, we can track that down. Thank you. Appreciate it. Councilmember Williams. Thank you, Chief. Um, just quick question. How does station staffing differ by district? Because like uh, with station one that has the highest call volume versus I think station 11 had the lowest. Mm -hmm. How does the staffing at those differ or does it? It, it does. We have at, at our in our busier places like that, we'll have double company houses like that. We're, the engine and the truck there, we have an engine, truck and an ambulance there at station one. Um, each one of our large apparatus has four person staffing. So there's 10 people who are going to be working at a time there at Central Station versus uh, Station 11. You have one engine there with four people on it, so you have four people there. So that, that's kind of how that, that looks. Is it, the busier districts, we try to have the double company houses if we can, and you're spreading out your, your aerial coverage as well. You want your aerial ladders to be able to make it to structure fires um, you know, within the the time that we that we want to see them there. So so kind of try to work those two together. Okay. Do all the stations have an ambulance as well? An ambulance and an engine? No, sir. Okay. They they we have ten we have ten uh, ambulances. And so we have three stations that don't that don't have an ambulance. And I anticipate we'll we will over the next few years we'll need to add additional ambulances, especially as we see. Um, one of the things we had looked at when we were asking for those two ambulances last year, we looked at the 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 age as, as it goes up. You know, it's 2022 to 2030. You're going to see a hundred percent increase in the 65 and older range, which is where 50 percent of the right. of the transports were coming from. So we'll, we anticipate having to 
to add uh, ambulances to keep up with that. All right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Appreciate all you do. Thank you. Next item is uh, item four, consent and regular agendas. Is there any item that uh, council member would like to remove? Uh, Mayor, I'd like to remove item C. Okay. Item C. Any items for uh, discussion or future agendas? Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, in consideration of the discussion that a couple of council members pointed out with the heat maps on 75, um, I think it would be worthwhile for the council to get a briefing on what's going to happen on 75 in the very near future. I think that Assistant City Manager um, Jack Carr also knows where I'm leading on that in that uh, the discussion of changes on 75 and what's that, what is that going to mean, which will also may mean um, more issues on 75 than we have today. Okay. Right. I'll second it. Thank you. <clears throat> I now declare that the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present. We'll begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Reverend Day Young, pastor of the West Plano Presbyterian, and the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge led by Law Enforcement Post 911. Would you all please stand? I invite you to pray from your faith tradition, from wherever faith tradition you come from. And uh, so let us pray together. God of justice and mercy, thank you for the gift of life and the opportunity to serve the people of our city. Help us to act with character and conviction and help us to listen with understanding and goodwill. Give us a spirit of service as we convene our meeting, may we be mindful, especially for those of those who are in need in our community. We ask for your blessing, and we thank you for all those around this table for their gifts and talents as they serve this community. Amen. Be seated. Well, good evening, everybody. We have uh, a couple of proclamations. The month of April 18th through the 24th is National Crime Victors Victims Rights Week. Uh, the Plano Police Department and Plano Victim Services Program help victims of violent crimes. So I'd like to call forward Gay Laco, Senior Police uh, Legal Advisor, and Christy Hoffpower, Senior Victim Advocate. Hi. So I, uh, I'd like to read the proclamation for this week. 
Whereas the United States Congress enacted the Victims of Crime Act in 1984, and soon after the Texas legislature passed a constitutional amendment guaranteeing victims the right to meaningfully participate in criminal justice process. Whereas the Plano Police Department's Victim Services Program provides services free of charge to help reduce the short and long-term effects due to violent crimes for those distressed and is dedicated to strengthening victims and those who survive in the aftermath of crime. These services offer a path to a better future for those who are affected by the unlawful activities of others. Now, therefore, I, John B. Munns, Mayor of the City of Plano, Texas, do hereby proclaim April 23rd through the 29th, 2023, is National Crime Victims Rights Week in Plano. I do thereby encourage all citizens to join me and the Plano City Council in thanking the Plano Police Department and the Plano Victim Services Program and all the criminal justice professionals who work with passion and resolve to safeguard victims of crime in our community. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for coming this evening. National Crime Victims Rights Week is a week to just honor the people who've had their lives altered and for, um, as being a victim of a crime. And so we want to show them support that they can come forward and be believed and supported. Um, many will need ongoing resources. So the Plano Police Department Victim Services Unit exists to provide comprehensive and compassionate services to help reduce the short-term and the long-term trauma that someone experiences as a result of their victimization. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give him a hand one more time. Our next proclamation is May is Building Safety Month. I'd like to call forward Celso Mata, who is our chief building official. Our continuing efforts to address critical safety issues in construction that affect our citizens in everyday life and national disasters assures us that our structures are safe and sound. Welcome, Celso. Building Safety Month. Whereas the city of Plano is committed to recognizing that our growth and strength depends on the safety and essential role of homes, buildings, and infrastructure play, both in everyday life and when disasters strike. Whereas modern building codes include safeguards to protect the public from hazards such as hurricanes, snowstorms, tornadoes, wildland fires, floods, and earthquakes. And whereas each year in observance of Building Safety Month, the City of Plano is asked to consider the commitment to improve building safety, resilience and economic investment at home and in the community, and to acknowledge the essential services provided to all of us by local building and fire departments in protecting lives and property. Now, therefore, I, John B. Munns, Mayor of the City of Plano, do hereby proclaim May 2023 as Building Safety Month in the City of Plano, Texas, and I do thereby encourage all citizens to join me and the Plano City Council in commending our dedicated staff and their vigilant efforts to uphold building codes to ensure Plano remains a city of excellence. Congratulations. Well, Building Safety Month is a national campaign that takes place in May, so we're a little bit ahead of the game, to raise awareness about building safety. The campaign reinforces the need for adoption of up-to-date building codes to help us build safe, sustainable structures for homes and businesses. And so we thank you, Mayor, for this proclamation and council and the support for Building Safety Month. Thank you, appreciate all your work. Thank you. 
Now it's my pleasure to finally give the oath of office to a, a potential future commissioner within the next 30 seconds. So I'd like to invite Bill Lyle down. Yay. Bill, welcome finally. Thank okay. You, I'm going to read the oath of office. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will faithfully execute the duties of the Planning and Zoning Commission of the City of Plano, State of Texas, and will, to the best of your ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States and of the state and the charter of the ordinances of this city? And you, there, furthermore, solemnly swear that you have not directly or indirectly paid offered or promised to pay, contributed, nor pr promised to contribute any money or valuable thing or promised any public office or employment as a reward to secure your appointment, so help you God. I do. Good. That was long, <laughs> but it was good. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank Congratulations. You. Congratulations. Thanks. Thank you all. And finally, for those who have served us so well, we would like to say thank you. So I'd like to call up an Andre, Gip, I'm going to do my best, Andre LaPayrollery. La <laughs> so far away. And Amit Warkod, thank you so much for, for your service. We appreciate it so much. Amit, here... Here's yours. Thank you so much. We appreciate the work you've done for us, and, and uh, the gratitude is, is a small appreciation, but we thank you so much. Okay. Comments of public interest? Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items, but may respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. We do have a few speakers this evening. The first one is Sharon Overall. Nuisance or dangerous, does it matter? No one has the rights to put chemicals into my body or onto my property, period. Smoker's rights, that is BS. The right of the person to not have to put up with another person's bad habits is all that matters. The argument that people have been smoking over 100 years is not a good argument. The argument that they are smoking on private property doesn't matter the second the secondhand cigarette smoke leaves the private property. When we lived in an early 1930s farmhouse, we were exposed to a lot of cigarette smoke. No bedroom doors were shut because there were only two window units. The pharmacist used to sell my mother V. Seal and K without a prescription all the time because of the four of his children were always getting bronchial infections or colds. It wasn't as bad when we moved to a different house where we could shut our bedroom doors and our game was far from the den. As a child at about age seven or eight, I remember dreaming of a day when I did not have to put up with cigarette smoke. This was shortly after I nearly died from secondhand cigarette smoke. I was laid up in bed for two weeks with bronchial pneumonia. I tried to tell my father that he had caused the illness, but he said it was in my head. I wanted to marry a politician who would make laws to, to end exposure to secondhand smoke. I later realized I didn't want to marry a politician, but I still want laws to end this. I knew then, and I know now, that the smoker's rights 
ends the moment that those toxic chemicals cause harm. I am scared to death that one of my close neighbors will move and a smoker will move in next door. I shouldn't have to live in fear. It is bad enough if I walk later in the morning and I'm assaulted with cigarette smoke from a person smoking in his backyard. I never see him since he is in his backyard, but I'm assaulted with his cigarette smoke and have to cover my mouth and nose till I'm out of his range. He can go inside and smoke and leave his neighbors in peace. Your job is to pass laws where your citizens are protected from unnecessary chemicals and threats. Whether you believe that it is a danger or a nuisance, the non-smoker has the right to clean air. The smoker is the perpetrator of the nuisance and is dangerous. Name one other carcinogenic chemical you can get away with putting into the body of another person without going to jail. Ban smoking on all city-owned property. Pass a nuisance law that cigarette smoke on private property cannot enter seconds. adjacent property. Thank you. The next speaker is Stephen Griffin. My name is Steve Griffin. I'm a resident of Plano and uh, living in the uh, area around Custer and uh, Legacy. And I just wanted to, I'm, I'm going to be voting soon here. And I want to make an informed vote for this election and subsequent elections. And something that's concerned us in that area, you might think, is our development there at, uh, you know, called uh, what, Legacy Square at Custer and Legacy. Uh, we call it Stalag 13, but that might be uh, actually a little bit unfair for Army barracks. I, I've, I've, I've never seen, I've, I've seen military barracks that have more style than what was built there. But uh, I wanted to just, I wanted to kind of want to just find out, you know, every time we drive by there, and it's not us, it's every, dozens and dozens and dozens of your constituents that I've talked to in that area, they they just, we look with disbelief. How could something so banal, so uh, bereft of any kind of creativities, whose fourth grade granddaughter designed this thing, decided that they would drop a whitewashed plywood box in the middle of the city of, of excellence? It's not excellent. It, it, it's, uh, it's ugly, and so I, I'm addressing the uglification of Plano. It's not the development of Plano that I object to. I, I realize as a city builds out, it has to build up, and, and, and you have to deal with that. But the, does it have to be so ugly? And so I thought, well, maybe I'm missing something. So I decided to take these pictures, and I, you know, I'm, just to make it simple, so that you could see the structure. How many of you have seen? Is that okay to ask? How many have seen this uh, structure? In, in uh, and uh, and then it's just a picture of my neighborhood. It's like you know, literally thousands and thousands of neighbor of residential areas in in Plano. It's very very typical. And uh, you know, I see when people drive through Plano. They say this beautiful brick structures of all kinds, and they love the the uh, uh, varied insets and uh, what would we call that? The, the, uh, uh, the, the setback from the lots. You know, you've got little recessed coves and stuff and little turrets sticking out. All the things that make Plano property look nice, whether it be residential or business, whatever. But I look at this monstrosity and we just look at each other and disbelieve it. How in the world could something like this be done? Well, I got a vote here, and I just thought, is it okay if I take... It must have had vigorous support among the members of this county. I don't think you can build something like that without the approval. Am I correct? Please, perhaps there's somebody who can help me. You have to... Can you... And I'm not talking about, I know there was a zoning dispute, so I'm not talking about the zoning. I understand that. I'm talking about just because it's zoned multifamily, do we have to uh, put Stalag 13 in there? I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. I, I 
can't count how many citizens share your concerns. Uh, with I this, uh, with this project, uh, respond. I'm sorry. No, no. Just oh, keep going. With this, uh, with this project, mm -hmm. um, it was built according to pre-existing zoning, and as such, it never yeah. had to come before council for approval. Wow. The uh, the builders developed it according to everything that was allowed under pre-existing zoning. The only thing they had to do was right. get a plat approved, which was an administerial function, not subject to... Um, so the appearance of a structure you could put, as long as it complies, I realize it was zoned yep. uh, yeah. multifamily yeah, and, so and that sort of thing. So did not require council approval. Yeah. It, we can't discuss yeah. it under, under, it's not agendized, okay? Right, I understand so, that. So this is, I appreciate your, your response, but uh, okay. it, sure. it, it was approved long before this council. The, the actual uh, aesthetics <clears throat> of the building. But, sir, there's a state law that restricts our ability to regulate the aesthetics that passed, I think, in, um, it was in 2019. Yeah, so the state has preempted our ability in many ways, and we can get you some more information okay. if you have his email on I that bill. I would appreciate that. Should I give you a call or what? Yeah. We'll, we'll email okay. you. Okay. We'll get your, right, we'll so get your that, contact information. So you can... If, as long as it complies with the basic zoning, and I'm not talking about zoning here. Do you understand that? I'm talking about how ugly mm -hmm. that you can, you can comply with the zoning law and put something beautiful. You don't have to, that's my time is up. The, so, but, sir, the state law restricted cities a few years ago from- And it says a, you can put something as ugly as you yes, want. Any, basically you meet minimum there. construction wow. standards. Well, I know there are a couple of candidates for the, the assembly that want to change that too, I think. We'll, so. we'll send you the information. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Peyton Jackson. Good afternoon, Council. Betsy Lucy Anarka. Betsy Lucy Anarka. Betsy Lucy Anarka. The reason why you don't know who those amazing women are is due solely to white supremacy. And with the majority of deaths being preventative, I would say we are the foundation of a mastered industry that is still killing us today. OBs and nurses replaced midwives like Big Pharma replaced holistic healing. And if you think the opioid crisis is bad, imagine not qualifying for the chill pill simply due to the color of your skin. The problem is y'all don't think that black women feel pain. Because when you swing, we get back up. But angry black women, the second we swing back. I promise you I'm not mad, but I have every reason to be. And I need all of my anti-abortion people to stand up because the experiments, the modules, that Mr. Sims practice weren't just on the bodies of my sisters. You see, after he treated the mothers of healthcare, the mothers of modern gynecology like guinea pigs, he took a stick and jabbed it into the head, heads of newborn babies. Please don't ignore that like you ignore the mortality rate. It hurts like hell being black in America. So every time I go to the doctor and they tell me my pain is normal, they are absolutely right. But you know what? Like the great George Wallace once said, reparations now, reparations tomorrow, and reparations forever. Thank you, Council. The next speaker. The next speaker is Bill France.
Mayor Bonds and members of City Council, good evening. Uh, my name is Bill France. I'm a 26-year resident of Plano, and I'm here tonight to applaud your efforts to meet with our Planning and Zoning Commission on May 8th to enact a temporary ban on short-term rentals throughout our residential neighborhoods. This ban is essential to address the fundamental problem, the destruction of the sense of safety, security, and community that is lost when long-term residents who we know and trust are replaced by a revolving door of strangers and transients. We believe this is a pragmatic, necessary, and lawful first step to bring back the peace and serenity of our suburban communities. Thank you again for your time and continued commitment to this urgent and important issue. The last speaker is Greg Patillo. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Greg Patillo, a 29-year resident of Plano. In the discussion and debate regarding short-term rentals, I've heard the term fiscally responsible used on more than one occasion. So tonight I would like to present data, benchmarks, and insight that will hopefully change how that term is used in the future discussions so that it might more accurately reflect reality. I recently presented data regarding the gap between hotel occupancy tax calculated based on the revenue reported by AirDNA and the remittances reported by Plano under the voluntary collection agreements with Airbnb and VRBO. That gap represents an estimated $1 million of uncollected occupancy tax since the agreements were signed in 2019. VCAs offer no realistic opportunity to improve compliance and allow hosts to operate anonymity. The fact that Plano had no data on where short-term rentals were being operated and had to pay for Deckard services can be traced back to this decision to enter into these agreements. Also, the city appears to be planning to shoehorn the administration and compliance of short-term rentals into existing systems and processes. If that is indeed the plan, it would be the most expensive and unproductive path forward for the city. Using one full-time equivalent per 100 listings benchmark experienced by Granicus Host Compliance, a consulting and software firm that specializes in short-term rental compliance, and last month's active listings on Airbnb and VRBO, this approach will cost the city approximately $300,000 annually for the administration and enforcement of registration codes and taxes, as well as handling calls for service. Using the previously proposed $300 registration fee, the city will have a minimum net operating loss of $75,000 annually. More, risk, more realistically, Plano will experience the same low registration compliance as other cities, and the loss will be closer to $150,000 uh, and continue to increase with the number of rentals. There are uh, ways to lower these costs. Certainly one option is to do what Plano has done with hotel occupancy tax, which requires few resources but encourages noncompliance and forfeits revenue, allowing fewer short-term rentals and leveraging technologies like Granicus Host Compliance that lowers the number of FTEs required per listing and shifts operating expenses to software license fees that can be paid using occupancy tax revenue. Full disclosure, I have no financial interest in this solution, just an interest in how my tax dollars are spent. I believe, like myself, most Plano citizens would support a one-time expense of our tax dollars to defend the city's legislative power to create zoning ordinances that protect the health, safety, morals, and general welfare of our community. I also believe, like myself, they would strongly object to using our tax dollars to subsidize the businesses of a handful of individuals and companies most of which are not Plano citizens, so they can make one to $2,000 more a month from an activity seconds. that lowers my property value, makes my neighborhood less safe, hurts Plano schools and businesses, and increases Plano's cost of living that is already 12 to 13% higher than the national average. They would also be frustrated to learn that the city is failing to collect all the occupancy tax it is owed because Plano ceded their authority to tax and audit these businesses to the platforms through that offer transparency. Hopefully, if you choose to use this term fiscally responsible in the future, you will do so more appropriately. Thank you for your time this evening. Let's move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. 
Motion to approve the consent agenda except for item C is in Charlie. <clears throat> second. Second. Thank you. I have a motion a second to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item C. Please vote. Councilman Smith, try it one more time. Oops. You pushed on your speaker. <laughs> it's all right. Motion passes eight to zero. Item C. <laughs> Item C, RFB number 2023-209, Dash AC for a two year contract with three automatic one year renewals for living screen maintenance for Parks and Recreation Department to Carruthers Landscape Management Incorporated, 308 Construction LLC, doing business as 308 Solutions Group and the Davy Tree Expert Company in the estimated annual amount of $127,600 and authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents. Ron Smith, your Parks and Recreation Director, here to answer any questions. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, I, I pulled this off of the consent agenda because uh, I had asked some questions, uh, and, and obviously uh, Parks and Recreation provided uh, great information in response to that about uh, how we decided to utilize an outside contractor for this work rather than doing it in-house, um, and you, you know how we determined that that was the most cost-effective solution and I received back uh, some information uh, uh, midday today um, regarding uh, regarding this, and uh, just so that everyone is on on the same page, uh, the information which I, I very much appreciate. Thank you so much for this information. Um, was that uh, you know we began uh, intensive trimming of the existing living screens last year. Um, that uh, that effort will continue uh, this year, utilizing uh, the additional supplement. Uh, that we received, and once the intensive trimming has been completed, um, that uh, the, the staff response said we should be able to maintain an ongoing 90% uh, to 10% ratio of contract versus uh, in-house and some other information, and thank you again for, for this helpful information, was that uh, specialized equipment to improve the department's uh, production and maintaining the living screens was requested in the 21-22 operating budget but was unfunded. Um, and uh, then there were some amounts about contractual funding uh, approved in, in the 21-22 budget of uh, 84,600 and then 43,000 um, in, uh, in the 22-23 budget and uh, that the future uh, inventory of living screens is unpredictable because we don't know when HOAs will surrender them to us, but we also don't know when they'll be uh, replaced by, uh, you know, uh, brick wall. or masonry, yeah, some, some type of, 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 of physical screening wall. Uh, I guess living screens are physical, but you know, like a, like built with bricks or, or stones or something. And so, um, anyway, and and then uh, I had sent back some some additional questions, but through the back and forth, that ended up being about three o'clock today. And so uh, uh, there was uh, um, um, not uh, not not a chance for a response on that. So I just wanted to to ask those questions uh, here, which um, um, was that the first was that the response mentioned. Uh, uh, specialized equipment that was uh, requested in the last budget cycle but was unfunded and I just wanted to ask if I'm uh, correctly understanding that if that equipment were to be funded uh, and, and perhaps an additional uh, couple of employees were hired uh, would we be able to do this work in-house? Thank you council member. The, uh, the specialized equipment would allow us to top those screen walls that have gone unchecked for several years there would be some areas where we still, as a Parks and Recreation Department, would not go to because of the power lines and the other uh, overhead obstacles that we would want specific contractors or utility contractors to take care of those. But we would be able to handle more than what we are able to handle right now with that piece of specialty mm -hmm. equipment. And do we know how much that equipment would cost? Is it cost effective to, uh, to do that? It's an expensive piece. I don't remember exactly what it was. We did submit it last year so I could be able to pull that quickly and get it to you tomorrow. But uh, it, okay. was a, it was a big, you know, six-figure type piece oh, of okay. equipment. And then um, I know that the ratio, uh, as the packet pointed out, for example, for mowing is 70% in-house, 30% uh, contractor. Um, it looks like uh, the ratio that's anticipated here is only 10% in-house, 
90% contractor, which struck me as being, you know, a heavy contractor utilization. And obviously, you know, when you utilize a contractor, there's a, a profit margin, uh, you know, on their end. And, and, and uh, uh, just wondering if that may be the most cost effective solution. So, um, so I wanted to, um, to see what the reason for that, that anticipated yeah, ratio was. We still was. think that that is the best solution for our living screens. We have approximately four miles of living screens throughout the city, 26, I think, or 24 locations where we have those living screens. When you compare that to our park system, where we have a lot more turf that we maintain, and so the ratio for those fewer living screen locations, higher on the contract side, 90%, 10% is uh, the general upkeep once a contractor has gone in and done an aggressive pruning of those living screens. Whereas the mowing is something that we are taking care of on a daily basis sure. for about nine months out of the year. So there's a different ratio. And we think what we've got right now is a good mix for the living screens. Okay. And, and then just a, a follow-up on that. I understand also we're in a period of intensive maintenance, uh, intensive trimming right now. And that will be followed up with kind of less intense ongoing maintenance. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Our long-term goal would is we're evaluating every location that we have these living screens. Uh, what is happening is... Uh, we have some living screens that fall to us when uh, a maintenance agreement with an HOA uh, falls off the table. So then we've got to go in and provide some really intensive work on a living screen that has gone unchecked for many years. We would prefer to have a contractor do that uh, when it's that intensive. But once the screen is, is trimmed down to a more manageable size, we can periodically, once a year, uh, once every two or three years even, go in and make those uh, smaller trimmings to keep it in check and keep it in a sustainable form and fashion. But we are continually looking at what is the best way for us to um, provide that screen, whether it is a living screen. Uh, we've had some really good success in the past four or five years replacing old living screens with newer living screens with irrigation, uh, proper uh, landscaping so that it doesn't grow out of control. We can maintain it more frequently or with a screening wall. So there's a lot of options that are always in play and we're continually evaluating those. Well, and thank you for all of that information. So that all kind of comes to the, the question, I guess I still don't understand, you know, if we have, if we're going to reach kind of a stabilized level um, of, you know, the type of, of less intense, uh, ongoing maintenance that, that it sounds like it would be appropriate to do in-house. Um, how then will we end up at that ratio of only 10% in-house, 90% uh, contractor? Well, that's where we're at right now. Okay. And that's what we think is good for living screens. 90% of the work on the living screen with a contract, 10% in-house. And if when we do get to the point where the majority of our screens are under control, then the contract number would gradually go down as we're able to maintain it with what we've got in-house. Okay, gotcha. You know, and I guess if that, if that equipment is, is, it sounds like the equipment would be six-figure equipment to do this. And do we have an estimate of how many years this intensive trimming period is, is going to be going on? I think or? we're getting close. I mean, a lot of the okay. areas that have been a real problem with this contract that's in place, and we've done it for the last two years, has been very effective. So we like the direction that we're going. I would say uh, we would be able to provide uh, an update maybe in the next three or four years to see where we are citywide with those screens that have been uh, gone unchecked by certain uh, landscape agreements and things mm -hmm. like that. Specifically, there's a, across from the, the new uh, Collin Creek Mall development on Alma Road, those uh, living screens were we're really out of control. And so we've done some intensive work there over the last two years. And it's something that you can't do every year. Otherwise, you really run the risk of killing the living material. So you have to go incrementally. Okay, gotcha. Well, I, I think that makes sense given, you know, given the, uh, you know, the, the one-time cost of the, uh, uh, of the equipment being six figures and the fact that, you know, that, that we may um, only be in this intensive period for an, another three or four years, it sounds like that may not you know, maybe more cost effective to utilize a contractor that already has this equipment. But I'd love to see, you know, over the next couple of years, if, you know, if it's possible as, as we start to have, you know, knock more of this intensive maintenance out and have more um, of the ongoing maintenance to, to bring more in-house so that hopefully we can, you know, continue to be cost effective. And I always appreciate the great information that you and your team provide 
uh, you know, whether it's mowing or living screen maintenance or anything else, you know, about how um, how we can be cost effective by by bringing things in house. So thank you, thank you for that. And with that information, I'll, I'll move to approve. Thank you. Second the motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve item C. Please vote. Thank you. Eight, motion Thank passes you. eight to eight to zero. Next item, items for individual consideration. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. Presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests were received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Item number one, consideration of an appeal of the Heritage Heritage Commission's denial of a certificate of appropriateness to make storefront alterations at the front west facade at 1422 K Avenue. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Mike Bell, Conference of Planning Manager in the Planning Department. We have kind of a unique item for you tonight. It doesn't come up very often. It's an appeal of a certificate of appropriateness that was denied by the Heritage Commission. It's unique in that the Heritage Commission does not often deny CAs. Um, in fact, we don't often have appeals either. The last appeal that came to council was five or six years ago, and this is the first appeal um, under the new standards for the downtown Heritage District since it was adopted in 2016. And we, we think that's a testament to how effective the standards are and really our, our commitment to getting people to, to a yes in an approvable, approvable condition. Getting into the specifics of tonight, I'll give you kind of the overview and then we'll, we'll start to unpack it. The property is located at 1422 K Avenue and located within the downtown Heritage District. It's currently occupied by McNeil's Tavern and Eatery, who is the business tenant and also the applicant for the CA. Uh, the certificate of appropriateness is requested to replace exterior doors, um, but I'll note that the replacement has already happened. The doors have been removed and new doors have been installed. And so this is seeking retroactive approval to bring them into compliance. And the CA was denied by the Heritage Commission on March 28th. Uh, it is located in the downtown Heritage District and also within the downtown's listing on the National Register of Historic Places. It's property number 35. They're on the right side of the map. Uh, important to note is, uh, as you're aware, um, Plano does not have a uh, a large number of historic resources out of a city of 290,000 and over 200,000 jobs. We have just one um, historic business district and that being the downtown area. A little history of this property specifically, it was built in the early 1900s. It's a vernacular commercial style, which is prototypical for the downtown area. Historically retail and commercial uses. And again, it's unique in that it has five addresses on one lot. So the four doors you see in the photo are 1422 through 1428 K Avenue. There's a separate building that faces 15th Street. The property we're looking at here is the one outlined in red, the one-story building on the right side of the photo. A little bit of background. Um, this property did receive a CA in 2019, and it was a substantial CA. It included partial demolition of the, the property that faces 15th Street. You can see it there on the left side of the photo. Um, and then they were constructing a new four-story addition at the rear of the property. Uh, that did not include any changes to the historic storefronts. The property owner has abandoned those plans and the CA has since expired. Uh, in 2022, the suite got a new tenant. Um, the suite was renovated for McNeil's Tavern. They did receive a building permit for those interior renovations, but important to note, it did not the scope of that permit did not include any exterior changes. Uh, once the work was complete, staff did uh, identify that the work was done without the necessary approvals. We met with the applicant in August and informed them um, that this was, this was out of compliance and that it may affect their tax exemption. So we really wanted to be proactive with them and, and get them um, into compliance as soon as we could. 
Um, we didn't hear much after that, so we met again with the applicant and the owner in November to discuss options to bring them into compliance, again with the tax exemption deadline looming. Um, ultimately, they chose not to apply for the tax exemption, um, but did end up submitting the CA application in February of this year. The scope of the project includes removal of the bifolding accordion style doors that you see in the photo on the left. They were wood framed with glass and they have already installed the new roll up style door which has aluminum framing. Uh, again, glass panes that are more of horizontal, horizontal proportions. The door does function uh, to open to create an open air dining experience and uh, a unique ambiance. So you can see that's how the door operates. And then unique is, we're talking about 1422, but the, the actual restaurant occupies two spaces um, that function as one, it's 1422 and 1424. But only the door on the right side of the photo is the one in question. And as I mentioned, the council doesn't see this, um, these types of requests very often, so I think it's important to walk through um, what the Heritage Commission considers when they're reviewing certificates of appropriateness. It's kind of a, um, a common misconception that it's, the commission is pretty policed, that it's about what looks good or what doesn't, but I, I wanna to demonstrate to you that there is a methodology about what is appropriate or what is not and how the commission applied that in this case. There are four steps. Um, the first is to deter determine the building's significance. Is it, is it historic or not? Uh, to do that, you start with the date that the building was constructed. Uh, we have two periods that we look at, the period of focus and the period of significance. Um, and then if it's built outside of those, uh, it, it's not historic. So those two periods are what we would, if you're built in that, in that period, you could be considered contributing to the district. So that's a term I'm gonna be using. And then the design standards are meant to give more or less flexibility depending on when you were built and how significant you are to the district. The property we're looking at is within the period of focus. So it is one of those that's um, key to, the, key to the, um, the status of the district. Because of that, it's, it's considered contributing to the downtown heritage district and also contributing to the national register listing. Uh, but important to note is that we have these surveys done every few years uh, by third-party consultants, and they noted that although the storefront alterations on 1422 depart from historic precedents, they are key contributors to the district. And what I want to caution on that is, that, is we think that the property is borderline contributing based on the alterations that, have, that were pre-existing to today. Um, so what does this mean? It's a contributing building. It's important that we maintain the, care, the key character-defining elements that varies from property to property, but generally the kind of features you see are, are listed here. It's important that we preserve those original materials where they exist. And specific to this building, we need to use caution that the future alterations don't jeopardize that contributing status. Again, we think it's borderline. The next step is to look at building integrity. And again, once those key, in short, it is looking at those key character defining features and saying, what condition are they in? If they're mostly original and they're in good condition, it's considered to have high integrity. If they're substantially altered or in bad condition, it's low integrity. And, and based on where you fall in that range, you're in one of four categories ranging from intact, mostly original, to substantially altered. Um, and through the renovation process, you can move from one category to another. Looking at the property at 1422, you can see in the top left is the oldest photo we have on file. It is from the period of significance, appears to be in probably the 1950s, uh, and, and what the original storefront looked like. Uh, and the bottom left is a photo from 1980. You can see that the storefront had been altered, probably to modernize in the mid-century. Uh, and that stayed that way until the mid-2000s. There's a 2003 photo there um, in the bottom. And uh, again, the storefront's mostly the same with the, the change in canopy. And then in the mid-2000s, a previous tenant, uh, Kelly's Eastside, occupied the space and built the canopy, the outdoor seating, and constructed the doors, the wood doors that you can see in the photo on the right. The integrity for 1422 is that it does maintain some original materials, brick construction, parapet walls, proportions of the opening haven't changed, but it does have those non-historic alterations that were mentioned in the survey, the doors, windows, and the canopy. Uh, what this means for the property in terms of analysis is it is the moderately altered category. Uh, and this is an important point. It's uh, because those previous doors are not original, their preservation is not critical to the integrity of the building. 
we're not concerned that the existing that the existing doors were removed. That, that's not a concern in this case. But ideally, the replacement doors would improve the integrity and at the bottom line kind of uh, be a sideways movement, not reduce the integrity of the building. So those are the things we're looking for. Um, step three is to look at the use. What's the desired use of the project? The best one is always what it was originally designed for, but the standards are intended to be adaptive and flexible to allow properties to stay in use. The best way to preserve a building is to use it, not let it go vacant. Uh, for this property, we, bar restaurant is appropriate based on its history and its location. Um, due to the lack of original materials, we also think that use of the door to create that open air dining experience is appropriate. Again, we don't have the original storefront and that is a functional adaptation that makes the building flexible. Uh, however, we also believe that proportions of the storefront opening are historic, so we don't want to see the opening widened or changed at all. And then the last step is choosing the appropriate treatment strategy. So you know, the, you know, taking the first three steps, you can choose what's the appropriate strategy here. It varies from building to building based on the individual considerations. But basically, there are five steps, and they're in a preferred order as listed here. The first is to preserve. If you have an original material, keep it as is. We don't have an original in this case, so that doesn't apply. The second is to repair. If it's, if it's original, but it's deteriorated, the intent is to repair it back to its original condition. Again, that doesn't apply in this case. So moving on, the third preference would be to reconstruct it. So if it's missing entirely, as it is in this case, you would reconstruct it from the appropriate evidence. And that's the photographs that we showed before. That would be the preferred option in this case. But there are other alternatives. You could replace if there's no evidence, which is not the case here, but you could replace with a simplified interpretation of the original, which has been done in other locations downtown. Or you could do a compatible alteration um, if, as, long as, it doesn't, um, minim as long as it minimizes the impact to original features and distinguishes new from original is another possible alternative. In this case, we would ideally like to see the site reconstructed based on the photographic evidence, but we acknowledge that's really not the scope of the permit here. They're not doing a full on rehabilitation. Um, so we think that an open air adaptation is an acceptable alternative so long as it meets the standards of the district and, and we, we agree with the intent of creating that dining experience. So looking at specific standards of the downtown area, uh, some guidance is that it's to avoid confusing mixes of styles or periods that affects the significance of the property. In staff's analysis, the roll-up door does create a mix of styles from the contemporary styles, materials, and proportions that are not um, often seen in the downtown district. Uh, I want to note, though, that the roll-up door in itself is, is not necessarily a problem. It would, be, it would be more appropriate on a building that had a automotive use, for example, where they had roll-up doors. This would be a, a very appropriate application in that situation. Uh, what we would recommend is a sliding or a hinge door that, when fully closed, replicates the historic storefront. It also goes on to say that many storefronts in downtown have uh, components seen on commercial buildings. This repetition uh, is, creates this unity along the street that's worth preserving. In our analysis, the proposed horizontal proportions and multi-glass panels, aluminum frames, are more contem contemporary than the other buildings on the block. And this breaks that repetition along K Avenue. And, and I'll show you that photo in a second. Um, but I, I, we also want to acknowledge that that repetition isn't totally obvious just standing on the street because there is a canopy, a dining area, a tree in front. It is hard to see that repetition just standing or just passing by on this, on, in your car. But you can't see these are the two properties to the left and the two properties to the right. Generally, they maintain the same characters found through most of downtown, kind of a central door. Uh, a storefront window on either side, generally vertical proportions in those openings. And there is some flexibility in the design of replacement if it reflects the scale and proportion of the traditional Plano storefront. Again, those horizontal proportions are, are the key in this one because that roll-up door is not typical for Plano storefronts. Uh, they would typically be divided into multiple doors and windows for those vertical proportions. And again, um, French bifolding or slide and fold type doors that have been used elsewhere in the district uh, would be a more appropriate application to maintain that open air effect. Uh, to summarize the issues, again, the building is contributing but has lost some of that integrity due to the alterations over the years. Uh, we, we urge caution that any future alterations not reduce the integrity and jeopardize the contributing status of the property. 
again, those previous doors were not historic, so that's not necessarily the concern here, but we want the doors to meet the, the replacement doors to meet the design standards. Uh, ideally, reconstruction would be the preferred treatment here, uh, but a contemporary interpretation could also be appropriate if it meets those proportions and the repetition as described. I'm gonna wrap up here. Um, since the Heritage Commission doesn't have the video like you may be used to seeing with planning and zoning, I'm gonna recap the discussion at the commission. Uh, it is outlined in the vice chair report provided in the packet. Uh, but after staff presentation, the applicant did state that uh, the accordion doors were in bad condition. They needed to be repaired. Uh, they, they weren't being, gonna be able to be saved. Uh, they were not aware that the CA was required. The building owner didn't inform him, nor did his contractor. Uh, he believes the roll-up doors create that unique dining experience and, and helps promote its business and uh, comments that, that people make positive comments. Uh, he owns several restaurants with roll-up doors and they, they're all very successful because of that concept and he doesn't believe the door detracts from the historic character. Some questions from the commission to the applicant was, do you have other restaurants that use this style of door and are they in historic districts? Again, the answer, he, he does have restaurants but, that use these doors but they're not located in historic districts. A comment was that the building looks generally very appealing. It's unfortunate the owner didn't inform you of the requirement to get a CA. Uh, and then are you opposed to replacing with a more suitable door? And again, the applicant uh, stated that the, the door had already, been, had already been installed, the money had been spent. It was his intent to see this process uh, through the appeals. Um, some questions from commission to staff. Some of these you may be thinking yourself is, was staff able to sit down with the applicant and go through the options? Again, we, we always try to do that. We try to get them to a yes. Uh, but in this case, it, it was pretty clear that they were intent on, on seeking approval for what had already been installed. Uh, how did this go through permitting without alerting the applicant the CA is required? Again, that's because the scope of that permit didn't include the exterior renovations. Typically, if it had, building inspections would have flagged it and alerted the heritage team, and, a, and the CA would have been required at that point. If it's denied, can they choose not to replace it? Uh, well, at that point, it's a, it's a zoning violation, so uh, there is enforcement uh, steps that could be taken. If it's approved, would the property automatically lose contributing status? This is a tricky question. It's not gonna be automatic. Again, we have third-party companies come through every few years, and they give us our third, their third-party recommendation as to whether they're contributing or not. We think that it, it could lose the status um, based on its approval, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, would the loss of contributing status impact the property owner or the applicant? In this case, it's the property owner. They are the ones who are eligible to receive the tax exemption or the tax credits from the state and the federal government. Uh, how would the loss of contributing status impact the district overall? Um, this one property going to non-contributing is not going to make, uh, is not going to change things radically. But again, as you piece these over time, you start to see the sum of all this become, uh, at some point, the district is in jeopardy. Um, and is there anything to make the roll-up door workable? Uh, we, we thought about this a lot. In, in our opinion, there's really not a lot that can be done to, to utilize the existing door. Uh, following those questions, they had discussion. Um, I think a key point was they felt the property owner should have informed them of the, of the requirement to get a CA. Again, they had, they had gone through this process in 2019 and were aware of the requirements. Um, if the property owner is the one impacted by the loss of the contributing status, and that might be an incentive for the property owner to participate in replacing the door. And then there was concerns that that precedent would be set in allowing the roll-up doors and how that would affect the rest of the district. Uh, to sum up, the Heritage Commission voted 7-0 to deny the request for the following reasons. They felt the style, design, and materials uh, diminished the historic integrity of the building. The door did not meet the downtown standards. It's not a compatible alteration. The door jeopardizes the status as a contributing structure and approval of the door may set a precedent for the downtown district and influence future alterations in their contributing status. Um, and again, the ordinance does allow the applicant to appeal city council, so your options tonight are to grant the appeal or to uphold the decision of the Heritage Commission. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. <coughs> Councilmember Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you uh, for that great presentation, Mike. Uh, <clears throat> I certainly sympathize with a, a small business owner like Mr. McGill. I also think it's, you know, it's very important to, to maintain our downtown historic district and make sure that all property owners are, are treated fairly. If I'm understanding you correctly, if, if, if this type of alteration were to happen at every property that's a contributing structure in the downtown heritage district, would we be, uh, the district would be jeopardized potentially uh, National Register status would be would be jeopardized. Am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. And I don't want to oversell it, but it, it is a risk. 
Uh, again, those third parties give us their recommendations. And enough, if enough buildings are not contributing, it doesn't meet our requirements for a historic district. Okay, and you also alluded to uh, to, to the uh, the tax incentive program, uh, you know, for uh, 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 heritage tax exemptions. Uh, I think you said that for this past year, after the alteration was made, this property did not apply to uh, participate in the tax exemptions. But prior to that, historically, has the property received tax exemptions through the heritage tax exemption program? Yes, they have. Um, in 2022, they were denied for not having made their poor rated repairs. Okay. And then they chose not to reapply again to the program for this year. Okay. And just to get a feel for how much Plano taxpayers have invested in in uh, the Heritage Tax Exemption Program, as I recall, typically when we approve that list, it's somewhere over $100,000 per year uh, of, of tax exemptions in the downtown Heritage District. Is that is that correct? I don't know the number off the top of my head. Babesh, do you know the number? I'm sorry, I don't have it. Sorry, well, I, I, I could be wrong about that. That was off the top of my head, too, just thinking about, you know, that list comes in front of us once a year, and I feel like that's ballpark, you know, maybe what the uh, what the uh, exemptions cost. But, uh, and, and, and do you all remember how many years that, that program has been going on? Uh, I know it's been a long Since time. Since the 80s. Since yes. the 80s. So, um, so I, I think it's fair to say that Plano taxpayers have invested a very significant amount of money through tax exemptions in preserving the downtown heritage district. <laughs> well, it's a, again, it's a tax exemption, yes. So. Yeah. So, I mean, but the other, you know, the other taxpayers who are, you know, who are, are you know, obviously Correct. have to kick in a little more if there are tax exemptions given, uh, you know, so it's been a significant investment, especially. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and, and finally, you know, I think it's very unfortunate, as the Heritage Commission expressed, that, uh, that nobody informed uh, uh, this lessee of this property that, that a CA would be required for this type of a project. Um, I know that the, the owner did not inform them. Uh, their contractor did not inform them. Um, do we typically find out if there's a sale of property in the downtown heritage district or if property is leased? And if we don't, is there any way to require that so that, you know, so that we would have the opportunity to be proactive about informing uh, new, new owners and lessees of, of requirements? We do that. We do try our best to learn about those. We don't catch them all. Sure, sure. Um, we do try to work with property owners. Typically when we see it is when a new tenant comes in for a sign. The sign requires a permit and a CA, and that's when we get a chance to reach out to them with the new tenant. Um, but we are also working with Michelle Hawkins, the new downtown manager, to be a little more proactive in reaching out to the, the, the new tenants as they come online. Okay, well, and, and fin final question. Do we know dollar amount, you know, how much uh, has been invested in this new uh, roll-up door? I think, I think he cited a number around 9,000, but the applicant is, may be able to answer that better. Okay. okay, well, thank you so much for that information. Councilmember Grady. Thank you. Just a few questions that I have from staff, and I'm trying to get a little bit of a timeline. Um, uh, it appears that uh, from appraisal district records that um, the Labrisa's property um, was purchased uh, in about 1993 from JLM Enterprises, which seems to be a similar uh, initials to the current owner, uh, Juliette Lamarche, I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing the, the name correctly. Um, is that a sim is that an entity that simply transferred the property from one business entity they own to another, or was that an actual new purchase sale? I don't know the specifics of that. I, I know it is the same owner, Ms. Lamarche, um, from 2019. Um, Okay. Yes. Um, do we Sorry. know when JLM purchased the property? I don't. Do you, do you know that information, Manesh? No, I don't. But I think we've been working with Ms. LaMarche for ever since I'm here. I've been working with her. So the property owner, she owns this property in the last recess incorporated from what I understand. But she's always been our property owner contact. Okay. So it would be prior to, say, 1980? I can't say for that. I'm not sure. Um, from the photographs that were furnished, uh, it appears that the storefront was modified somewhere after 1950. I think that you, you have that one photograph labeled as unknown, but I believe that your estimate is correct because it, in, in my opinion, and you know, I'm not uh, absolutely accurate, but it looks like that's about a 1951 Pontiac chieftain sitting in front of the store. Um, then again, it was modified in 1980, and it was modified again in 1986, and then again in 2003, 
and finally in 2010 to the current modification of the storefront. Do I have that timeline kind of correct? So those are the periods where we have photos. So the change occurred sometime between the 50s and 1980. It, it stayed roughly the same. The canopy changed at some point prior to 2003. And then from in 2000, we don't have the exact date, but mid 2000s is when Kelly's East Side moved in and added the canopy, the awning, the outdoor seating. And mm -hmm. it stayed that way for many years. Um, Kelly's was there for a while. Um, and then the last couple of years, they've had a, a little bit of turnover in tenants. And so the signage has, has changed, but generally that appearance has been the same. Okay. Um, it appears that the storefront was modified in 1980. That was probably a significant modification because the, um, the brick frontage on either side of the central door were removed and full length windows were put in and the, um, the actual door was moved in its location. Um, and I assume that there was no heritage commission um, at the time to really be concerned about the modification? That's um, the heritage preservation ordinance did not go into effect until 1979. So this could have been prior to 1980. Yeah. Uh, but again, the, the downtown district wasn't formed into, until 2002. Okay, and then it, it, uh, the storefront was modified again in 2003 approximately to an open air style with accordion doors um, was there any concern of the modification in removing the um, then current storefront to an open air environment? We don't have the, the, the record from that time to state if there was concern. Um, again, I think the, the context matters a bit in that it was early 2000s and that was downtown re revitalizing and trying to come back from its um, a little bit of period of decline. And so I think there was probably a little more flexibility given at that time than there is today. Okay, so if I'm understanding correctly, there wasn't a lot of concern about taking the storefront off and, and putting on accordion doors and leaving it as an open air environment, which would be a significant modification, even though the space was the same size. Purely speculation on my part, but I don't have a record to indicate that. Okay, and, and kind of dovetailing on um, Councilman Riccadelli's question, um, when the building department starts looking at these things uh, for building permits, do they notify the Heritage Commission if this deals with a, um, with a historical structure? Yes, they do. If the scope of the changes includes exterior changes, yes, typically we are alerted. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Mayor. I'm given to understand that another property in the area, Urban Crest, has a roll-up door. I never noticed it, but um, uh, can you speak to what might make that different? Sure. I actually have photos of those doors. So um, in, in the case of those, there's actually two locations, Event 1013, um, as well as Urban Crest. You can see those, those doors do not roll up. They essentially are hinged and fold up uh, as is, as, oh, and the one on the right is accordion style, but essentially the same function. They fold up and not roll up. And then they also have the added function of, you see here, they actually mimic the flat canopy that would typically be seen on a historic storefront. So they kind of serve two purposes. And they look more vertically oriented. Correct. Thank you. Council Member Holmer. Just a quick question. I want to make sure I understand if, if the business had previously been an auto repair shop that had rolling doors, then it would have been acceptable? It's because of the, the historic... What, what I think you could make the case that that's a good interpretation of the building and its historic use. Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so we, we have the responsibility to uh, either grant the appeal or, or uh, continue with the... Uh, his, Heritage Commission's denial. Mr. Mayor, can I just ask one more question? Please, please. So, um, so what was the original use for this building? So there's a drugstore sign, ghost sign on there. I think there's a laundry mat. So it's been a, a number of service and <laughs> yeah, 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 a number of commercial buildings, commercial uses. But not for like auto repair. No, I'm sorry. I we have a, uh, the applicant to speak. It's actually another speaker besides the applicant, oh. but oh. if the applicant wants to speak, we can add him to the list. 
Would the applicant like to address the council? Thank you. I apologize. I, I didn't realize you were you were up there. Oh yeah, um, I bought photos, but you guys seem to have them. I have current photos of. Um, we just wanted to share what we've been doing. Dining. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I'm a, my name's Tom McGill. I'm the co-owner with uh, Chris O'Neill. So you can see it took many, many hours for us to figure out a name for McNeil's. So um, <clears throat> we came up with that and uh, all parties were happy. Um, <clears throat> as we discussed earlier, <clears throat> I had many restaurants, you know, um, that I uh, ran, operated, and um, <clears throat> this one downtown became um, our little gem. <clears throat> we saw an opportunity to come down here. We saw a vibe that, that needed to be created, and we wanted to create it, and we wanted to be part of it. We uh, did our homework, you know, and we talked to uh, all the different downtown owners. <clears throat> and that really sold us on downtown Plano was <clears throat> every business that's downtown Plano is owner operated. They're hands on. Um, they're there. They don't hire, you know, outside managers. They don't have a kid, you know, making forty thousand dollars a year, you know, running their place. It's them. They're all they're all here. And um, Chris and I, <clears throat> that's that's what we do. I mean, we're owners, we made a significant investment, remortgaged homes, we moved around 401ks to um, put the money down to uh, make a splash in downtown Plano. Um, we're all about, you know, the vibe. And when, <clears throat> before we did this, we did our homework, you know, we talked to Lockhart's and we talked to 1418 and we talked to Vickery and we talked to Fillmore, we talked to the owners and, um, it was, very, it was very encouraging, inspiring that one, <clears throat> the owners were there. We weren't talking to a GM, you know, they're, they're there. And we were telling them about us and they knew about us and um, they welcomed, you know, it wasn't really competition. They were just saying, it's power in numbers. We need to get downtown going. And um, <clears throat> so we were blessed that we had the opportunity to take 1422. <clears throat> we have, um, the building itself, <clears throat> we have nothing against. We wanted the history. I mean, we wanted a building <clears throat> that was very unique, old, and that we can just really didn't want to take anything away from it. We wanted to keep it the way it was, but bring life into the building, bring life onto 14th Street that was non-existent, and uh, or on K Avenue and <clears throat> turn it around and just create, you know, a great vibe and be, you know, business-like, business-friendly with everybody. And um, <clears throat> the only <clears throat> getting into our personalities is we came up with our menu, we came up with what we wanted to do, and we thought it would be a great, you know, idea to kind of, you know, <clears throat> join in to what everybody else is doing in downtown and just be part of the circuit. And uh, we were very supportive with all the business owners. And we did all just cosmetic inside. I mean, the brick building inside, we have black and white pictures in there. We, you know, we have wood tables. We, we changed nothing as far as that. But the outside, <clears throat> it's appearance. I mean, people are coming down the street, they're coming with strollers and this and that, and the place needed a facelift. I mean, you guys kept on talking earlier, you know, well, they refurbished, I mean, they changed this, they changed this, you know. Probably the facelift of that front was probably changed, you know, a dozen times. And we didn't want to change it, you know, we wanted to leave it. We inherited the, uh, the awning, we put our tables out there, we put flower boxes, hanging plants, we just made it beautified, we made it very comfortable, where it was an attraction, where people come down and they're going like, wow, this is nice. When those doors were there, <clears throat> that was part of our, you know, our cleanup. And we had a contract to come look at the, you know, the doors. And uh, they were just rotted out at the bottom. The glass was, you know, out. I don't know when they were putting in, but if you date it back, they were just, 
they were just shot. I mean, it took Chris and I, you know, together just trying to open and close them, and then it just, it, it was, they were just shot. So we did go to the landlord, we talked to her, we said, hey, <clears throat> we took care of everything in here, you gotta help us with this, you know. Um, she goes, what do you wanna do? And I said, well, we wanna replace them. She goes, well, first get me three estimates from contractors saying that they need to be replaced. We did, and they had no problem saying these are rotted, you know, we can, it's cheaper to build new doors than to, you know, to put up, you know, uh, to fix them. So when we looked at it, again, like you said, <clears throat> I had in the past, you know, roll up doors and they were just easy access. They, I mean, I thought they looked good. They looked good on the building. And we had, a, you know, someone come in, they did a picture of it to see how the building would look with a roll up door, a garage door. And um, it looked, I mean, it looked great. I mean, personally, we, we thought doing this for freaking 30 plus years, it took nothing away from the building. We brought that to the attention of the landlord. She thought it was a great idea. She says, okay. She's like, you know, we'll do it. So um, we did, we got a licensed contractor um, <clears throat> who was referred to us and uh, had a great reputation. And um, Joe Willis, I believe, I think a lot of people know him from Plano, but um, he came, took over and, um, Honestly, for our part, we thought we were done as far as give us a quote. He did it. We got a few estimates. He came in right in the middle, but he had the, uh, the resume as far as, you know, doing the right thing. So we said, do it. So <clears throat> not throwing anybody under the bus, but we didn't know that we were obligated to do anything else. We just thought we were paying the bill. Here's your check. And everything was good. And we did. We paid the bill. And here it is. But... Um, <clears throat> that said, that's when all this came crumbling down on us. Um, but just getting back to it again, uh, I get it. We don't want to change nothing. We actually, you know, like knowing that there is a foundation, you know, that watches the buildings. Um, you know, the biggest compliment that we get <clears throat> is um, you guys are in downtown Plano. You know, like, wow. I mean, downtown Plano. And it's just... Um, you know, <clears throat> there's hundreds of little, you know, you know, strip malls and centers and this and that. And people say, yeah, I'm from Plano. And they go, where? And then when you're given the address, they're like, oh, where is that? But when you say downtown Plano, I mean, it's like just everybody knows downtown. They know exactly where you are, you know. And um, so it's, it's very humbling to be down here. And um, we wanted to create and be part of, you know, the small town vibe. Like we, you know, get along with all the owners. We have our own little, you know, you know, chats, and we watch out for each other. And um, <clears throat> we we noticed we just had our first anniversary this past Saturday, and um, I mean it was a hit. I mean it was just um, <clears throat> I never saw so many people come out just to say like you know thank you. I mean it was just. Uh, I mean, it was very humbling to see. And when I say that, I mean, we did, you know, 177 menus, and we usually take 14 days to do that, and we did it on one Saturday. So it was, um, it was people telling us, thank you. You guys, you know, are great to be here. But we play an important part, because as owners, when I hang out with David from 1418 and Jeff from Lockhart, like we see things every day. If I see a quick trip, you know, cup laying in the street, I pick it up as I'm walking across the street. You know, managers don't, anybody else doesn't do that. We do that because we have a lot of pride and respect for downtown. We try to cause, create the vibe amongst all of us where, you know, <clears throat> we had a couple of, you know, this couple with their friends a couple of weeks ago came by and they, they sat at our table right on the walkway and I bought them out menus and they were like, we're just gonna have drinks. You know, these are people from out of town and they really wanna take, taste Texas barbecue, so we're gonna take them to Lockhart's. And I said, well, Lockhart's doesn't have a patio. <clears throat> it's a beautiful day. Go now to Lockhart's, get all your food and bring it here and eat and I'll have your cold beers ready. And they looked at me and they're like, are you serious? I said, yeah, that's, that's what we do. We're downtown. I mean, that's, that's what we do. And the guy goes, okay. I mean, like, holy crap. But that's how us as uh, owners, we get along. 1418, their coffee, we actually put it on, you know, our menu because we do breakfast on Saturday and Sunday. We say, please come get your favorite coffee at 1418 and come have your bacon and eggs at McNeil's. 
and they get a kick out of it. And they just think, they just, are you sure you don't? So no, we don't mind, man, that's, that's, that's how we roll here. You know, that's how we, we get along. So um, I just want you to know, as owners, you know, we have a pack. I mean, we, we have an investment for downtown and we want to invest in downtown and we want to build it up. And um, we're not going to do nothing against you know, breaking any rules. We want, you know, the buildings to stay as is. But getting back to why we're here with the garage door, <clears throat> I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest, we, it just never occurred to me. I mean, we did our homework where the facelift of that building was changed many a times. And we were like, well, I mean, like you guys discussed earlier, Kelly's walked in, I know they were successful, but they changed the front and they threw in those doors and this and that and nothing was said and they go, they look good. You know, and then, you know, this, <clears throat> things have changed. So we're like, okay, now that we're here and we're at this point, what is wrong? I mean, when you look at the pictures, um, what the door, the garage door, what does it do? What does it take away? I mean, what what is about that door that just hurts the whole ambiance of this building? You know, and we feel nothing. If anything, the door brings out the building and lets people actually acknowledge it. But with that being said, the flip side is when I was telling people over the last six weeks what I'm going through, they're like, they're going through what? And like the door. And they're like, and then a lot of them, because I, I get there in the morning. It's up, I mean, the door is up 15 hours a day. So it's, you know, we always leave, we have heaters outside and, you know, we have the uh, air curtains for the, uh, the summertime to keep it. But I just feel that the investment we made to put that door in had nothing against doing something, you know, behind anybody's back. We didn't, we thought we were doing right. We thought we were enhancing the building. It was on our tab. We did it, and the guests, if you're gonna look at the people that downtown, they, they love it. I mean, they enjoy it. I mean, I know we have a committee that, you know, has to make sure every building is, you know, to code, but again, if we're, now that we're here discussing it, <clears throat> it was changed so many times. So this is 2023. I don't know when it was done with Kelly's, you know, the 80s, but if you want to go through things, then why can't 2023 be the time where, you know what? We love the building and we can bring it up and have a door like this, because this is the world we live in, this is what we got, and this is what's going on. Okay, all right, I appreciate it. Thank you. No, you, you're on a roll, and I'm, I mean, I, I don't well, want to slow you down, but right. I'm going to have sorry. to. It, uh, does anybody have a, a question for, for the applicant? Councilman Smith? Yeah. First of all, comment. thank you for having a business and investing in downtown Plano. All of us have tried, and we want to continue to see our downtown become successful. From what I've heard tonight, and this is just my opinion, what I've heard tonight from Michael and the folks is, I don't personally believe that the roll-up door has significantly altered the hysterical, hysterical, <laughs> historical aspect of the property. I mean, as we've heard, uh, the doors that you took out were in bad shape and they weren't original to, to the building. Uh, from looking at the photos, things, I think it all blends well. I think your color choices were good. I think the ability to fully open this up as you've done and provide a, a, a real open air experience like that is only going to continue to, to attract people because this this is this is a, a good concept and, and I want to see you continue to be uh, successful and attract other businesses that come down as you say because there's a camaraderie among you know all the owners down there to work together to, to all to be successful so I'm I'm in favor of it and I I would. Uh, no, well, I'm, I'm not. No, I'm not going to do that yet. But I'm just saying, I'm in favor of, and I, I would like to hear what everybody else has to uh, to say about well, it. Well, let me have one more speaker, uh, if that's okay. We have one more speaker. I'm not changing my mind. Well, that's fine. No, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not. I'm just. So, if, if you don't mind, let yeah. me let me hear from the last speaker, and sure. then we'll we'll discuss as a council. Pam Holland. I didn't forget about you, Ms. Holland. I'm, I apologize if you were concerned. Pam Holland. I live at 1611 H Avenue in the Haggard Park Heritage District adjacent 
to the Heritage District where this is all going on. And I think I heard you say something in your opening remarks that based on the number of speakers, you know, you might get adjust the time. My remarks will not be long, but I hope you'll hear me out. Uh, I did have these finely tuned and timed remarks that I have had to adjust based on this presentation. So hope you'll uh, take some of that into account. Uh, so it's going to contain some of the stuff I was going to say and then some other stuff. Um, I've heard uh, some remarks about kind of subjective judgments about like what looks good, you know, does this go okay? You know, it's not that the door looks bad and everybody is entitled to their opinion, but city staff is not charged with that, making those pretty police judgments they are charged and Heritage, Condition, Heritage Commission is mandated to do what Michael Bell just told you about. That is their process. That is how we protect this singular irreplaceable asset of downtown Plano, National Register designated. Uh, I've been to a number of these appeal meetings and often the conversation does go in this direction of uh, well, they've already spent the money and we don't want to create a hardship, especially on small business. And sometimes the word egregious gets in there. I've heard that used a number of times, actually, in separate meetings. Like, this isn't so egregious. You know, what, what's the problem? But that is not what is in question here. Uh, I'm going to push back on a few counts. Um, the first one, I believe, is the most important after listening to everything. That is the notable absence, deafening silence, the owner of the building. I do not think you could have a better representation of my neighborhood than this guy that just spoke. This is what living in downtown is like. It's a very cooperative, engaged environment. Uh, we have a property owner that owns substantial footage uh, on that part of K. She's not that engaged. The fact that she left that guy hanging when he was going to make this substantial investment and not tell him he needed a CA, you should not be the heavy handed people here making this ruling. Should not be Heritage Commission who's being called the bad guy. It is a landlord who does not inform her tenant of his obligations. I say, take a denial of this appeal and take it small claims and get his money back so he can replace that door in a way that reinforces his concept. Clearly it's working. It's really livening up that part of the street. It's great, but there's many good options for that. Attachment six shows some great options and some of the other pictures. About 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, will a single set of overhead doors be the death knell of downtown? No, it will not. But as Michael Bell said, it's the drip, drip, drip of not supporting these design standards that will erode the singular place that we call downtown. Um, bending to somebody's, and I, I would, I was originally going to say self-imposed dismay, but it's, I don't think he, I don't think it's really his deal. I think it's the landlord. Uh, bending to that difficulty at the expense of the efforts and vision and intention of committed staff and committed preservationists, uh, that's just wrong. So I hope somehow, I, I would wish you would deny the appeal, but to give him ammunition to go and get satisfaction so they can, he can get his doors fixed in a way that echoes the rhythm, the historic character of downtown. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any more speakers? All right, good. Thank you, Mayor. You know, hearing all of this, I feel like there's got to be, you know, some type of solution that's not just yes or no, because I really sympathize with this owner who's trying to do a great thing in downtown and has incurred significant expense and, you know, don't want to create a hardship at the same time. I don't want us to do something arbitrary because we have, you know, uh, in our packet, we have certificate of appropriateness criteria 
And, you know, I don't really see which of those criteria enables us to say that the Heritage Commission got this determination wrong, and I don't think we should just nullify the standards that we've created, you know, because that wouldn't be fair to other property owners to say we won't do that for you, you know. And so, um, so it really feels like a conundrum. Uh, uh, Mike, when you, when you were up there, you talked about, you know, working through attempts to get to yes. Did staff propose any any middle grounds uh, uh, that, that were not accepted? And just wondering what might be out there to explore. Yes, that that was our approach. Um, that was that was the expressed to the applicants. We could let's let's talk through this and find a way to get something suitable. But again, it was quite clear that they were just going to pursue what they had already installed. Gotcha. Well, and, and thank, thank you for that. D did you have any specific ideas that you mentioned? No worries if that's premature, if it was just like, no, we're not willing to consider anything, and so alternatives were not proposed. I don't think it got but, to that far, correct okay. if I'm wrong, Vavesh, but we, we did talk about, um, we, we did provide the examples in the packet of, mm -hmm. of suitable ways to do folding doors in a way that is mm -hmm. still kind of compliant with the guidelines. Okay. Well, th thank you. You know, so... Do you think, um, I, I just wonder if we, if we tabled this for two weeks, if there might be a further conversation between the owner or the, the lessee and the staff, you know, if, if, if that was kind of, you know, if the, okay, well, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, just, I just think it doesn't sound yeah. like there's a solution from the staff other than changing the doors. Well, They're suggesting yeah. to change doors to vertical folding doors. So okay. either way, he's going to be required. If yeah. we deny the appeal, he's going to be required to change the doors. Yeah, I, I suppose that's true. I'd, I'd love, yeah, and, and I guess the other thing is, is there any, um, I know we have various, you know, programs downtown. Is there anything that we have that would help with the financial hardship, you know, that, that, that this lessee might be uh, eligible to apply for? The, the primary is the tax exemption, which are meant to offset yeah. maintenance requirements. There are state tax exemptions for rehabs and repairs. I'm not sure if this would qualify for those, but it might be okay. something worth exploring. Gotcha. Okay, well, thank you for that information. You know, I guess if if this is a decision we're going to have to make tonight, I mean, it's it's a it's a tough decision for me. I really, really sympathize with, you know, this situation and, and, and you know, feeling like it's just about a door. But... Really, we, we have designed standards for a whole district, and I, I don't think it would be right to do something arbitrary, you know, just because, um, you know, just because, you know, our own aesthetic senses um, don't see it a certain way. I, I think, you know, we have adopted uh, a certificate of appropriateness criteria, you know, the Heritage Commission that we've charged with these duties has made a determination based on those criteria. And so even though I do greatly sympathize, I just, you know, I, I don't think it would be fair to all of the downtown property owners or in the, or in the interest of the downtown heritage district to overturn the well-considered, you know, opinion of the staff and the heritage commission that was unanimous. That's been great. Um, I appreciate the comments from my esteemed colleague over here, although I disagree with them. Um, now, I looked at this from every aspect that I po could possibly take a look at, and I came up with these thoughts. Um, the storefront has been modified several times. This is We're looking at this and saying this is a violation, but it was radically altered in 1980. <clears throat> It was radically altered again in 2003, and there didn't seem to be any kind of issue at that point in time with turning it into an open-air environment from what it used to be in the 1950 photograph. Um, it didn't seem that there was an issue in 1980 when it was modified, so um, it has been modified multiple times. Um, and that was the condition of the building that I assumed that the owners purchased at the time. The front as it has even stated in the literature, is difficult to see from the street. So um, a passerby, as it even says in the document, um, repetitions are less apparent to, pres to the present due to the front of the building being heavily obscured by an awning, patio, dining, and a large tree. So people passing by really don't notice whether this is a roll-up door or whether it's awning doors or whether it's the original storefront. 
Um, and in fact, with these uh, planter boxes out in the front, you almost would think that those are some kind of um, a brick motif as it was. Prior to 1980, the appraisal districts actually indicate that this building was modified twice in, in 1917, once in 1920 once in 1940 and again in 1960, so there's been heavy modifications on it. We can even see that in the photograph from 1950 when that large ventilation fan was on the building and was removed because it was a dry cleaner. Um, although it was never constructed, the commission at one time in, it had approved the construction of a four-story addition on the back of this building. Um, and that was not done, but that could have been a significant modification and there didn't seem to be an issue at that point in time. Uh, the brick and the window storefront was modified in 80 to an all glass front with the center door moved to the left of the structure. Then it was modified again in 2003 with accordion doors leaving an open environment and the, and the door into the facility was moved to the front of the, or to the right of the structure. So this front of this building has been altered multiple times. Didn't seem to have any objection to it until this roll-up door was put on. Um, the submitted documents also stated that the accordion doors replaced an earlier door and two large display windows that were not original to the building and it further states that because the original storefront lacks original features and materials, staff finds that the applicant's intent to maintain an open air dining experience to be an appropriate function adapted to this building so long as the proportions of the building opening were not altered, which they were not, and appropriate materials were used, and that seems to be the question. Um, the document also states that staff suggested the using of a sliding or hinge door that would fully close to complement the style and proportions of the, of the uh, type of the historic structure, um, and it further states that the storefront should maintain the interest of pedestrians by providing views of goods and activities inside. But then it also states that the, that the contemporary and not the, the, the according doors were contemporary and non-traditional um, and that the earlier front was heavily obscured. The difference to me is very little. Um, and, and as a side note, um, I've used accord, I've seen according doors on garages. I've seen tip up doors on garages um, calling this a garage door, trying to differentiate that from accordion doors, I don't find a lot of difference there. And I will tell you that the biggest issue with accordion doors is that running track on the floor because it'll fill with dirt and it will make it impossible to open and close. You've got to keep it clean all the time. Um, finally, I can't really see any reason to deny this at this point in time because of the modifications that have been done to this building for a significant period of time. Um, I don't find that this door is actually changing that entire open air uh, structure. Um, and so although I understand we have our own standards um, and there are newer standards, I, I really can't see any reason to deny this at this point in time if we really wanted to make it look like the original storefront, hire an artist and have them paint the bottom panel on the glass door to make it look like bricks. Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> so I, I tend to agree more with my colleague here, uh, Council Member Grady. When I look at these photos and you look back to the previous ones, to me it looks like, and maybe it's just my perception, but many of these were metal doors, that they weren't all wood doors before. So to say that he needs to, that it's not appropriate to have metal doors when it looks like Previously, there were metal doors. I'm confused about why we're saying he would need to move away from the metal back to wood when there was previously metal. Sure. So, again, those the alterations that were done prior to 2000 were before this was in a district. The ones between 2000 and 2006 or 2016 were under older standards. But to your specific question, Downtown went through a period of modernization in the mid-century where they applied these metal doors, they applied the stucco on the brick in order to look more like the new storefronts going up in the retail shopping centers to try to stay current and modern. So that was an adaptation at the time in the 60s. It doesn't match the period of significance of when that building was originally built, which was the early 1900s, and what the standards are trying to get back to in terms of integrity of the site. 
But but even the ones you showed us of Urban Crest and Event 1013, all of theirs are not wood, are they? Event Correct. 1030, they're metal, right? The, the key issue here is not is not the metal, it's the proportions okay. and the repetition. I just thought I saw something in the packet that said <clears throat> part of the problem was that they were metal. But if, maybe I misunderstood If they that. were, it's aluminum, which is not ideal. I think if they weren't painted, it would be a bigger deal, but... Um, Again, it's, it's the, the design standards allow some flexibility for modern interpretations. I think the fact that it doesn't have those proportions, though, is what keeps it from being a really a good example of a modern interpretation. Okay. Well, overall, I think to Councilmember Grady's point, there's been so many changes over time. I'm struggling to see how these doors are really altering the significance of this. So I'd be in support of the, um, I'd be in support of the appeal. Deputy Mayor. So I'm, I'm actually um, not in agreement with Mayor Pro Tem for the very first time. Um, I'm, I'm a liaison on the Heritage Commission, and I've been um, with the Heritage Commission on uh, a conference trip, I think it's in Ohio, right? And the amount of respect that we get from cities across Texas um, for our Heritage Commission and the work that we do here it's incredible. Um, we are looked up as a gold standard in what um, Heritage Commission should be and what it should um, entail. Um, our our um, policies, our structures, our um, procedures are copied by other cities in order to preserve what they uh, what their city considered to be um, heritage monuments. You know, something that they want to preserve as history. So. When my Heritage Commission tells me seven to zero that this is a dramatic change from um, the historic preservation of um, our downtown Plano, um, you know, I, I, I really do agree with that. Um, I, I understand um, progress is necessary, and I also understand that we want profit and we want, um, we want activities in downtown Plano. But one of the main attraction about downtown Plano is the fact that it is historical. This is what Plano was built on, preserved for, and this is our history. And one little change, yeah, it doesn't make a lot of difference, but eventually it will. When we start overlooking the press, you know, overlooking the little mod modifications, when we start overlooking our precedents of you know, making sure that the heritage, our, our watchdog, our Heritage Commission watchdog is trying to preserve us. Uh, I think eventually the, the, the charm of downtown Plano will <clears throat> erode. So I'm obviously um, upholding the denial. Councilman Williams. Thank you. Uh, question for you, Mike. Actually, a couple questions. Um, so we've heard that numerous changes have been made to the storefront over time, which is, of course, true. We saw the pictures. Did those changes predate the designation of our standards under a heritage district that we're reviewing as, as part of this packet? They predated the designation of the district, and they predated the current design standards that are in place since 2016. Yes. Okay. So we, <clears throat> all those changes occurred over the decades. Um, then when we applied the current heritage standards to preserve this in the target character that we reviewed back at the uh, beginning of the prior century. And uh, so it has not gone through changes since we applied those criteria, correct? Yes. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. And the characteristics of the storefronts that you were talking about in the 60s to try to modernize, I'm assuming those would not have... Uh, achieved a certificate of appropriateness. I think the point of preservation is to try to undo those things done in the 60s and get it back to the original <clears throat> character. Okay. Um, I'm a little on the fence about this, not entirely. I am very sympathetic to the, uh, the restaurant uh, owner um, and appreciate the work you've done uh, in the downtown area. Uh, at the same time, I agree with Councilman Riccadelli that the standards that we have in place um, we're put in place for a reason. If we think we need to revisit those, um, we can certainly do so. But 
Um, as was mentioned, the, the historic district is um, going to be very hard to turn back if we give ground inch by inch. Now, looking at the pictures, I mean, the, all, these, all these criteria are here. And just looking at the pictures, I don't think that the, uh, the door closed matches the criteria. Open, it might. I don't know if there's any room for a designation uh, to differentiate between open and closed, but I mean, these pictures that we were given, um, I mean, the door is invisible, pretty much. Um, we heard that the door is open 15 hours out of the day. I don't know. I haven't visited the establishment. Um, is that year round? Um, does it make a difference? I'd like your opinion on that. Yeah, I think ideally the design when closed would replicate the storefront. I think with the acknowledgement <clears throat> that to adaptively reuse this building for restaurant, it's acceptable to roll up during the daytime. The difference between this doorway and the other examples provided in downtown is in those examples, the door was centered on the, in the opening, the doors open on either side. It's still, even when those were open, they replicated the storefront. In this case, it just, it just doesn't. And so that's why they don't meet the standards. Okay. Then I, I think I'm at the position where the, uh, the landlord absolutely had a duty to inform the applicant that uh, this process was required. Um, it's a hard decision because I am sympathetic, but we're, we're not going to lose our downtown uh, character all at once. It's not going to become a geographical version of modern art overnight. It's going to happen one incremental decision at a time over many years, uh, perhaps many decades, as it did, which is why we're trying to reclaim it now. Um, so I think I would have to uh, reluctantly vote in favor of upholding the uh, Heritage Commission's denial. Councilmember Holman. Oh, I've got lots of thoughts. I, I'm a former restaurant owner in downtown Plano, so I am very sympathetic as to what it's like to own a business in downtown Plano, a historic building, um, and to try to run a, a, a seven-day-a-week business and wear so many different hats. And, um, you know, a lot of the reason, as, as the, the applicant stated, that he chose that location was because of the appeal of downtown. And I have nothing but respect for our, our Historic Preservation Commission and for our staff. They do an amazing job. Um, and, you know, that's a lot of the charm to downtown. And uh, to Councilmember Tu's uh, point and, uh, and Councilmember Williams, that we should trust our, our commission. I mean, there are times when our Planning and Zoning Commission makes decisions and they come to us to make that, that final decision. <clears throat> it may not always be the same. And I think that that they're doing their job and doing an excellent job, both the staff and the commission, and I respect them for that, but ultimately we're here to, um, to make the final decision. And I think um, a few different things. I appreciate uh, Pam Holland coming up and speaking about um, the holding landlords accountable, taking a landlord to small claims court. That's all fine and, and great in theory, but that takes money, that takes time, that takes you away from running your business. And I mean, it's a dollar and cent kind of business when you run a restaurant. I mean, it is grueling. I cannot stress that enough. I think everyone knows that. I've, I've, anytime I tell anyone I owned a restaurant, they're like, oh, what was that like? And I could never do that. It is such hard work. And so um, I don't feel like it's fair to penalize the, the applicant who's already invested $9,000 just in hard expenses. That's not even considering the time and the energy being here tonight. I'm sure he spent numerous hours um, with each of you trying to, you know, it, it sounds like maybe not finding alternate solutions after investing that money. Maybe was hoping to avoid spending any more time, energy, finances on it. Um, as was already brought up, um, Councilmember Grady, about the fact that the you can't really see because of the awning and the tree and the, this, everything in the front, it's really hard to, to see all of that. I feel like we have a responsibility to not put a small business owner in a position like this. So we need to be looking at what we require of a 
landowner or what is the application process, um, it's true. Usually it's not until someone puts in a sign permit that it, it's come to the attention of staff that, oh, what else are you doing here and how can we help you um, uh, make sure that you, you know, are in compliance with the standards down here and the staff does an amazing job with that. But we've gotten beyond that at this point and I don't feel like it's fair to, to penalize the, uh, the applicant. Um, let me see what other, I, I feel one thing that the city has already remedied, um, Michelle Hawkins being placed in that uh, downtown manager role does give us one additional liaison to hopefully help prevent things like that from happening in the future. I have a letter from a former, uh, not a former, excuse me, a, a fellow merchant in downtown Plano, the owner of the 1418 coffee shop, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to read all of it. It really spoke to just the camaraderie downtown, the vibe downtown, everyone wanting to work together um, and and being supportive of, of the applicant and, and us um, making the decision to, to approve uh, this appeal. So um, I, I think maybe we should consider looking uh, into to what we can do to make sure we don't find small business owners in a situation like this in the future. Um, you know, I'm very much an advocate for, for small businesses in Plano, and I cannot in good faith, after this money has been spent, he is a, a, a great addition to downtown Plano. Uh, my business was down there when the previous, or previous business went out of business, and that space stayed empty for quite a few years. And... It's my understanding that, um, well, and I think the applicant even said that there were other businesses. There's actually the leasing agents at the apartments nearby that once they moved in and, and started generating traffic down there, they said, thank you. It makes it so much easier for us to rent these apartments out when we've got lively businesses down here rather than empty storefronts. So I feel like all of his intentions have been good. He's done nothing but contribute to traffic in downtown, to other people's businesses in downtown, and we should not... Um, you know, penalize him for him not understanding that process. So I 100% uh, will support um, that we, I, I don't know, is it approve the appeal? Is that the correct way? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do want to reiterate my respect for the commission, for the staff. I know you're doing your job and you're doing an excellent um, job. And, um, you know, hopefully we can do something to, to make sure that we're not in a position like this in the future. But um, I will support this appeal. Councilman Smith. Uh, great points I think everybody has, uh, has, has made, and, and I respect the differences of opinion. I think that's what makes us a great governing body is because we can have differences of opinion. Uh, like Deputy Mayor, I'm also liaison to the Heritage Commission, and the things she said are right on. I mean, I mean, the point of the Heritage is to maintain the historical perspective and to keep that look and feel that did get us the, the historical designations. But as Councilman Grady so eloquently pointed out, there's been changes and changes and changes and changes to this building over time that were this building to not have had those changes and had all the original basically look and feel, maybe some different materials here and there, I wouldn't be in favor of it either. But that's not the case here. So I think we have to look to, to the future and the, the, I guess, the success, the continued success for our downtown area. And we have to use common sense sometimes. Sometimes, you know, things may, you can read something one way, but if you look at it from a common sense standpoint, how does it fit? What's the best solution for now? And I think by far the best solution for now is to grant this, uh, this petition and allow this businessman to continue because as a fellow businessman myself who leases the building, okay, sure, he might be successful suing his landlord, but ultimately, he's still paying for it. He, there, there's no free ride when you lease. The owner's going to pay money out. The owner's going to raise the rent or raise your common area, you know, maintenance fees. So you're still going to pay for it. So, uh, so just keep that in mind if, if we have something like this come up again that even though you can go back against uh, you know that owner it's still going to ultimately come, you know come back to you so so i'm still i'm in favor of it well uh, i'll be real brief because every everyone has said miss holland you're correct the onus is on the landlord and unfortunately we we don't we don't have control to 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 make them do anything more than that and it certainly isn't isn't something that he should be penalized for. So as hard as, uh, I think we all are very 
you know, conflicted here, but uh, I, I, uh, I certainly don't want to penalize somebody for, for a mistake somebody else made. So do I hear a motion? Make a motion that we uh, grant the appeal. Second. Okay, so I have a motion and a second to grant the appeal. So that'd be uh, in favor of, of, of the restaurateur. Everybody understand? Please vote. Motion passes five to three. There being no further business, the meeting's adjourned.